I was a 20 year old female at the time and I was just about to move out of my parents house two weeks later. I was going to be moving in my apartment in the city. It was a Wednesday morning around 10 a.m. I was on a summer vacation and I was off from work that day, so I was still in bed. My parents had left for work earlier that day. Back then, my room was in the basement and my window was right next to the stairs leading to the front door. I was woken up by the sound of someone walking up the stairs and I thought it was odd, so I got up. I took my phone and I went upstairs to try and get a better look at who this could be. Once upstairs, I saw from the kitchen window a man leaving our front yard and going back to the sidewalk. I was very relieved and I thought it was probably just someone selling stuff. But then, the man turned around, went back into our front yard and started walking toward the right side of our house where there was a door leading to the kitchen, right where I was standing. The man then knocked and he had asked if there was someone home. Looking back, I should have said yes through the window, but I was so scared and confused that I didn't say anything back. He then walked back to the front yard and back on the sidewalk and started walking away. Again, I was relieved and I then told myself that maybe it was just a friend of my dad's that I didn't know and that maybe he was looking for him. This didn't seem right, but I was trying to find any reason for this man to be there other than wanting to break in. Just when I thought the man had left, I saw him come back yet again and walk to the left side of my house towards the backyard. Now I was very scared at this point, and I knew he wanted to get in. I go to the front door, unlock it, and I waited for a couple of seconds. I then start to hear something cutting off the screen of my parents' bedroom window, and at that point I'm literally shaking. I opened the front door quietly and ran out of the house calling 911. Within about five minutes the police arrived, but unfortunately the guy had ran away and they never did end up catching him. Needless to say, I was terrified my first three months alone in my first apartment. This happened only a month ago, and it doesn't really scare me anymore. It just constantly makes me think, what if? I'm in college, and I'm still living with my parents and older sister. It was spring break, and my parents went on a road trip while my sister and I stayed home alone. Two nights after my parents left town, I was at the house alone because my sister was out with her boyfriend. It was around five or six o'clock, and I decided to go work out because I was really bored and I could use it. I live less than half a mile from my hotel, so I use their gym because it's so close. I was going to jog there like I usually did, but I changed my mind right before I left because I didn't want to walk back home from the gym. I knew that I would be all tired if I did that, so I got my keys and I decided to drive to the gym. I walked out of the front door and I paused for a second, because I got a random feeling to lock the front and back door. My mom is really paranoid about locking the doors and windows, because she's scared that a crazy person will break in or hurt us, or worse, kill us. She always tells me to lock the door, but I rarely do, especially if I'm leaving the house for only a short period of time. But for some reason, I got a feeling to lock the doors, so I went back inside, locked the back door, and made sure to lock the front door as well when I left. I drove to the gym, and I was then there for about an hour and a half. Not long after I got there, I randomly got a really bad gut feeling that made my stomach twist and anxiety high. I also have paranoia about things like my mother, but it's different. For some weird reason, I had blamed the bad gut feeling on my house catching on fire with no one able to save my dog because I had locked both doors, but it doesn't consume my thoughts or make me want to go home or anything. I finally leave and I get back home in minutes. My house wasn't on fire, which I knew deep down that it wasn't anyways. So I get out of the car and I walk to my front door, pulling out my keys to unlock it, but before I had even reached to unlock the door, 
I then paused because I saw a brown napkin looking thing wrapped tightly around the door handle. My mind instantly went to the recent fentanyl poisonings, and how there were cases of things like napkins and bills being smeared with fentanyl, causing people to overdose when they touched them. I didn't touch it. I called my parents because I started to get scared, and I didn't really know what to do. My mother was understandably freaked out, and she told me not to touch it. I talked with my dad, and men being men, no hate, logic is appreciated here. He tried to be logical, and then tell me that someone must have put an ad on the door handle, and that another person must have ripped it off our door. I then FaceTimed them, and I showed them what it looked like. It clearly wasn't an ad. It looked like thick paper bag material. I also made sure to tell them that I was staring right at the door handle before I left for the gym, and there was absolutely nothing on the door handle before, meaning someone came up and wrapped it around the door handle while I was at the gym. I was pretty freaked out, but it was early dusk outside, so there was still a good amount of light around me, thankfully. My mom calmed me down, but my dad was still thinking we were overreacting. I unlocked the door, got my gloves from my dad's truck, and I took the brown napkin thing off the door handle, throwing it on the ground very fast. I kept the gloves on, opened the door, went inside, put the gloves in the washing machine, then wiped my front door handle with Clorox wipes. I then shut the door and locked it, not knowing what to do with the paper bag that was just lying on the porch. I say paper bag now, because as I looked at the bag on the ground through the window, I could clearly see that it was a small paper brown bag, and it was 100% not an ad someone puts on people's doors. It looked like the type of paper bag that holds sauces or silverware from a restaurant, and it was curled into a C-shape from being wrapped around the handle so tightly. I kept watching outside my house through my windows, but I never saw anyone or even a feeling of being watched. I calmed down completely, and I had waited for my sister and her boyfriend to come home. I called my own boyfriend, and I told him all about it. He promised to leave me with Second Amendment protection for the rest of the time my parents were gone, because he was really creeped out that someone would come up and put a brown bag on our door, whether it had fentanyl or not. My sister came home, and I told her and her boyfriend everything. They were freaked out too also assuming that there was probably fentanyl on the bag. Them being there gave me courage. So I went back outside with gloves on, and I picked up the suspicious brown paper bag. I went back inside to show them. They both gathered around me, and then watched as I started to uncrumple the bag from its C-shape. On the inside of the C-shape, the part that was touching the door handle, there was a gooey clear liquid that had the consistency of runny snot smeared all across the inside of it. We all went silent as our fentanyl fears were even greater. I quickly closed the bag and then put it in the trash, taking off the gloves and putting those in the washing machine as well. That was the end of it though. Nothing new or weird since then. I really wish we had cameras or a ring so we'd have more information on who, how, and why. I would really like to know what you guys think it was. To anyone who hears this, do you think I'm overreacting? Do you think it really was fentanyl wrapped up in that tiny little napkin? Or do you think it was a sex trafficking tactic? I live near Houston, not too close, but in a good distance. I know the sex trafficking is hot there. Or maybe it was someone who was just really high and just randomly chose our house to mess with and actually put snot on our door handle. But that's really not likely because we have police officers that stroll through the neighborhood. And people don't just walk around high like that. It's a small neighborhood too. Only eight streets. And even without the police officers, this is a decent neighborhood with maybe a few but most likely no drug users. It's really just a bunch of old people. So, I don't know. What do you guys think? Please let me know in the comments, because I still really wonder about it a lot. What happened in this story took place around four years ago. To set the scene, 
Me and my family live in what you would say is a nice neighborhood. It's outside of the city limits, and the houses are not right on top of each other, but you could walk to the neighbors within three minutes or so. Therefore, it's not really the type of neighborhood that many scary or weird things happen in. Although, the only time I've ever really been freaked out over something that happened while living in this neighborhood happened in early summer, while both of my parents were at work, while I and my brother were at home alone. I was around 16 at the time, so we were easily able to take care of ourselves. It was really starting to get warm outside, and in our house, as we live in the south, so I then opened our sunroom door. I left the screen door shut, but I had opened the main door to let in some air from outside. After doing so, I lay down on the sofa, and I ended up dozing off. I was awoken by the sound of the screen door handle turning, and was sounded like knocking. It jolted me out of my sleep, and to my surprise, there were two men standing in the doorway, one knocking on the wooden part of the screen door, and the other was turning the handle, as if it was just going to come right in our house. I leaped off the couch and quickly went to the door, asking them what they needed. The older of the two men stated that their car was right down the street, and that their battery had died, and they needed to be jumped off. Now, at 16, I wasn't really thinking that they had any malicious intentions. So, I told them to wait a second, and I would call my dad and ask if he had any jumper cables in the garage. I closed the main door that had previously been open, and I went and got my phone off the sofa. The two men stayed in the same position and watched me through the door as I called my dad. From the start of our conversation, my dad was already really weirded out once I told him what happened and then he told me he had the jumper cables with him in his truck at work, and that I just needed to tell the guys to try somewhere else. After getting off the phone with my dad, I went back to the door, and I told the men I didn't have any. I then apologized for being unable to help, and I shut the door back. I then just watched them as they walked past just past the bushes that lined up our driveway. They got into an old silver sedan, and then drove out of our neighborhood very swiftly. I immediately started freaking out as they had literally just told me that their battery died and they needed to be jumped off. I called my dad back and I then explained to him that the men had just gotten into a car that was supposedly dead and how they sped off. He told me to just lock the doors and to call 911 if anyone else came back to the house. Thankfully, no one returned and nothing like that ever happened again. I can't even begin to imagine what would have been in store for me if there had been any jumper cables in my house. This happened when I was home alone as a kid. It was the summertime, and I was home during summer break. Both of my parents were at work, and I think I was about 12 years old. I have an older brother, and he went to one of his friend's houses that day. When I was home alone, I would just hang out and do whatever. Usually, I would go on the computer that we had and play Minecraft or something like that. It was probably sometime in the early afternoon, and I had been on the computer in the living room for a while. I moved into the kitchen to get something to eat. The kitchen was at the back side of the house, and we lived in a split level. I will also mention that the neighborhood was pretty average, and a little bit on the quieter side. It was when I was standing in the kitchen that I saw something out the window. I just barely saw movement at first, but it looked like somebody was walking by. I moved over to another window to see. That's when I saw a man walking to the back side of the house. He was wearing a sort of construction vest and had a hat on. I realized that it must be the meter reader. I remember that they came around every so often to our house. I calmed down almost immediately. I had been a little worried seeing a guy walking into our backyard. He went to the very back side of our house and near one of the basement windows. I went back to finding some food in the kitchen. After I was in the kitchen for a good five minutes though, I looked over and noticed that the guy was still there. Usually, they would come and go really quick and only be there for like a minute at most. I went back into the living room to go back on the computer, but a short time later, I just had the feeling that I should get up and make sure that the man was now gone. Maybe it was because I was home alone and a kid, so I was a little bit paranoid. I carefully walked back over to the window and could see that the man was actually still there. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't tell exactly what he was doing because I could only see part of him from the angle that I was at, which was higher up than he was. 
He seemed to be doing something and was near the basement window, but I couldn't tell what exactly he was doing. I thought about going downstairs and looking out of that window, but I knew that the man would see me right away if I did. I went to walk over to another window upstairs, which would have a better angle, but I had to be careful so the guy wouldn't see me. Unfortunately, I really messed up. As I was walking over, I accidentally hit a can that was near the edge of a counter in the kitchen. I knocked it over and it fell onto the ground. This made a loud noise, and the next thing I knew, I saw the man quickly walking away. He moved back to the side of the house. I moved to the front of the house, and I watched the man casually walking down the street until I could no longer see him. I felt like he was really suspicious. I questioned whether he was even a meter reader or not. Why would he leave so suddenly like that? For the most part though, I was just happy that he was now gone. I went back to the computer. I stayed there for the most part until my brother and parents came back home. When they did, I didn't even think to tell them about the guy that had been there. I thought he was gone for good. My brother's bedroom, as well as mine, happened to be in the basement, and my parents' bedroom was upstairs. Because it was summertime, we would stay up pretty much as late as we wanted. I remember that on this night, my parents went to bed, and my brother went down to his bedroom. I stayed up and was on the computer. All of the lights in the house were off, except for a small lamp in the living room near me. I stayed up on the computer until I got really tired, which was probably at about 1am. Then, I turned off the lamp and went downstairs to go to bed. When I got downstairs, I had to walk past a little living room that was in the basement in order to get to my bedroom. As I was walking past, I happened to see something in the window. The man was back. I could only see a figure of a man, but I could guess who it was. This was the same window that he had been at earlier in the day. I then heard noises coming from the window, as if it was going to come open. I was suddenly really afraid. It was really dark down there, and I hit the light switch, which I happened to be really close to. When this happened, it lit up the whole room, and I could no longer see the man very well. I heard some noise from right outside the window, though, and then it sounded like he was running away. I went running as well, but back upstairs into my parents' bedroom. I knocked on their door and yelled for them to wake up. About a minute later, my dad came out asking what was going on. By the time I explained it all, the man was long gone. My dad went out and inspected the house all around though. He was able to find that the back window the man kept messing with had quite a bit of damage. It had almost came off. It was like the man had been trying to remove the window and get inside the house, and he was really close to succeeding. After that night though, the man never came back. I remember being really scared for a while that he would, and I slept upstairs on the couch because I felt safer there. Luckily, he never did. This happened back when I was in college. During the summers, I lived back home with my parents at their house. I had almost the entire basement to myself, and they wouldn't really go down there much when I was gone. There was a big TV down there, and then my bedroom and a bathroom. It was really nice to have all of that space. I drove home from school after I had finished my finals and packed up my stuff from the college dorm. When I arrived back at my parents' house, they happened to be gone. They told me that they would be back in a few hours and were out for the night. That meant that I would be home alone. I did have my own house key, so when I got back, I was able to get inside. I spent the first bit of time unpacking a bunch of my stuff and putting some of it into storage and in the basement. I went down into the basement and I stayed in the main room and was using the TV for a while. It was then that I thought I heard a noise coming from inside of my bedroom. I hadn't been in there yet and the door was closed. I didn't know what it could be, but I wasn't scared or anything like that. I casually got up and walked over to the door. Then I opened it. When I did, I heard the sound of my closet door closing. It was kind of out of my view and when I looked over to it, the door was completely shut. Suddenly, I was now a little bit concerned about what this could be. Only a person could close the door like that, and I was home all by myself. I thought about going over and opening the closet door, but decided not to. I turned around and walked out of the room instead. I no longer wanted to be downstairs, and I went up into the living room upstairs. As I was up there, probably 30 minutes went by without anything happening. I was just watching TV and relaxing on the couch. Out of nowhere, I heard the sound of somebody walking up the staircase. I knew that it wasn't my parents because they weren't home yet. I looked over to the stairs. The person was not in my view yet, but I kept looking. Then I saw a man start to come into view, and he was walking up the stairs towards me. This guy looked a little bit older than me, but had a beard and long hair. He looked like he had to be on some kind of drug or something. 
As he approached me, I quickly got up. I backed away and asked him who he was. The guy didn't say anything. He just kept walking closer. I told him that he needed to get out of here or I was going to call the police. The guy didn't say anything though and kept getting closer and closer to me. I was backed up as much as I could and would soon reach the wall. He continued to approach me. I then ran to the side and was now in the back corner of the house. The guy kept coming near me. Then he started to charge at me. This guy had to be insane. When he lunged for me, I jumped out of the way. He caught part of my leg and I fell to the ground. The man fell also. I was able to get to my feet before he did and I ran to the staircase and went down the stairs as quickly as possible. When I made it to the bottom, I opened the door and left the house. The crazy guy did the same, but a little bit after me. I went sprinting down the neighborhood street, yelling at the guy to get away from me. He stopped chasing me eventually and kind of wandered off into somebody else's yard. Then I was finally able to compose myself and call 911. When the police got to my street, I didn't know where the guy was anymore. I had walked back to our house and was standing in the front yard. The guy ended up being found about 15 minutes later. I guess he went and hid in somebody's backyard and they saw him and called the police. The police happened to already be there a few houses away at my place and picked the guy up. I'm really not sure how he got into my parents' house or how long he had been there. I'm guessing he got in shortly after they left. I do know that he was there the entire time that I was and that really gives me the creeps. I live by myself in an apartment. It's really close to downtown of a big city. There are lots of people that live in the area, but I've never witnessed anything that crazy until recently. A few months ago was when the story took place. It had been another long day of work and I had just gotten home. I worked a long shift and I love my job, but it can be very tiring. After walking home, I got into my apartment building and up to the fourth floor where my place was. I got inside, closed the door and locked it like I always did and then headed to take a shower, put on some comfortable clothes, and go to bed. I had made it about 10 feet away from my front door when I heard the knob turning. Somebody was trying to get in. This was strange and something that had never happened before. I stopped in my tracks and then moved over to the door and looked out the peephole into the hallway. Nobody was there. Whoever had tried to enter, I guess, had just left. Maybe it was a mistake, or maybe it wasn't. Either way, I was really tired and just wanted to take a shower and go to bed. About 20 minutes later, I was in bed and just browsing on my phone before I fell asleep. During this time, all of my lights in my apartment were out, and it was completely silent inside. That's when I heard my doorknob being turned again. But not once this time, multiple times. There was no knock, but I knew whoever had tried to enter before was likely back. I couldn't sleep with the thought of someone trying to enter my apartment. I got up from bed and tiptoed over to the door to look out once again. This time, I saw somebody. A man stood there just outside of my front door. I kind of freaked out when I saw him. He looked kind of sketchy, wasn't well dressed or put together. He was just standing there and looking at my door. Then he tried opening it another time. He sort of looked around the hallway and then back to my door. I kept watching and he stood there for maybe another minute. Then he turned to the right and started walking away down the hallway. The hallway led straight down to the stairs and elevator area. I waited to make sure that the guy was leaving, and about 10 seconds after he left my view, I quietly opened my door. I snuck out into the hallway and took a few steps out to make sure that the guy was going to leave. Hopefully that would give me peace of mind and I could go back to bed. At first, I saw the man a good distance down the hallway, walking away still. He was almost at the end of the hall. But then, he stopped and turned around and faced me. He started heading towards me, and his walk quickly turned into a sprint. I hurried as quickly as I could to get back inside my apartment and close the door. As soon as I made it inside, I slammed it and locked it. The man reached the door probably a second later and tried opening it again. After he realized it wouldn't open, he pounded on the door a few times. I yelled to the other side, asking what the man wanted. He did not answer me, but kept standing there. I watched still from the people inside. He tried opening the door again. I yelled that I was calling the police, and then the man finally turned and left. Still, I wasn't convinced that he was actually gone. I waited around for about an hour, checking out my door every so often. He didn't return though. Finally, I was able to go back to bed. I haven't seen the man since that night, and looking back, I think he probably followed me home on the street.
I might have even let him into my apartment building without knowing. I didn't really pay that good of attention as I walked home, but now I do. I was 14 years old, and my mom and I had been living in a three-bedroom double-wide trailer ever since we left my dad. My mom worked a full-time job, which meant that from Monday to Friday, I would have the house for myself for about two hours after getting home from school and before she got home from work. I usually would spend my time on my computer or working on writing my D&D campaign, and in no time at all, my mom would be home, at least that was when I felt comfortable in my house. That all changed though. One day when I found myself walking in on a burglary in progress. I had just gotten home from school and when I walked into my house, everything seemed normal. I walked inside and locked the door behind me before taking my shoes off. And as I was in the process of taking off my shoes, I could have sworn I heard something come from the room where we used to store our moving boxes in the back of the trailer. At first, I assumed it was just a box or the house settling, and I didn't pay the noise any mind. But before I could even stand up from taking my shoes off, I heard it again. This time it worried me a bit, so I decided to call out to see if my mom had come home early. But when I yelled out, there was no response. Still something felt a bit odd to me, so I decided to check the room out real quick before getting comfortable. I poked my head through the door and looked around, but from what I could tell, nothing had changed, which reassured me that I had in fact heard the house settling. After that, I went about my normal routine. I stepped into my room and put my backpack on my bed before walking back out into the kitchen for a quick snack. I reached into the cabinet and pulled out a fruit roll-up but before I could open it, I heard another sound coming from the back room. Only this time, it was followed by something that shook me to my core. After the sound of something thumping on the ground in the room, I heard what was undoubtedly a man let out a single cough. I dropped my snack and instinctively began running through the house and toward my bedroom. I'm not sure why I chose my room instead of the front door, Maybe it was where I felt the safest, but either way, I sprinted into my bedroom, which was two doors down from the back room, and without hesitating, I did the only thing I could think of, just like I had seen in movies. I grabbed my wooden desk chair and propped it up against my bedroom door. It was perfect timing too, because as soon as the door was wedged shut, whoever was in my house began banging up against my bedroom door. I fell back in fear and began looking around to think of what I could do next. And that was when I came to my senses. I looked over to my window and saw my escape. I was able to open it up and push the screen out before climbing through it. And since we lived in a trailer, the window were only about five feet off the ground. Once I was out of the house, I quickly ran through my yard and over to my neighbor's house. It only took him a few seconds before he answered the door after I began pounding on it and screaming for help. My neighbor opened the door and I explained to him what was happening. He didn't question it at all and as soon as he saw the panic in my face, he let me into his house and we both waited there for the police and my mom to arrive home. The police showed up about 30 minutes before my mom did, but it was still too late to catch the intruder. By the time they showed up, he had already left the house. Not before destroying it though, all three of the rooms appeared to be ransacked and my mother's jewelry collection was missing. For a while, I ended up staying at my neighbor's house or a friend's house after school while I waited for my mom to get home. I just wasn't comfortable being alone in my house anymore. I recently moved into this quaint suburban neighborhood and ever since, I've had a sense of unease. The residents here were friendly enough, always waving and offering warm smiles as I walked by, but there was something about their gazes that left me feeling on edge. One evening, as I returned home from work, I noticed a flyer in my mailbox, an invitation to join the neighborhood watch, a group of residents dedicated to keeping the community safe. I kind of laughed to myself, as I always thought that was sort of a thing of the past, but I considered attending a meeting but my schedule was already packed and I had little time for social engagements at the time. 
As the weeks went by, I couldn't help but notice the watch members becoming increasingly more visible. They patrolled the streets at all hours. They even had walkie-talkies, and they were crackling with static as they exchanged updates and reports. It was pretty corny. But I appreciated their dedication to our safety, but I couldn't shake the feeling that they were watching me just a little too closely. It's worth noting that these stares and unwanted attention was nothing new for me. I have a neon green mohawk and a tattoo of a moth on my neck. One night, after returning from a late shift at the office, I found my front door wide open. Panic surged through me as I started to rush inside, fearing for the worst of being robbed. To my relief, nothing appeared to be missing or damaged, and I just chalked it up to my own carelessness and resolved to being more vigilant in the future. After all, it was pretty windy, and I suppose it is possible that I could have left the door slightly open. However, the incidents didn't stop there. Over the next few weeks, I found my trash cans overturned, my garden sort of trampled, and my car vandalized. I reported these events to the police, but they were never any leads or suspects. As the harassment escalated, so too did my suspicion of that neighborhood watch and the weirdos that were a part of it. Through all of these incidents, the neighborhood watch was always outside and around, and whenever I questioned them if they had seen anything, they mostly just shrugged and seemed kind of unresponsive. I began to wonder if they were behind these incidents and targeting me for reasons that I couldn't possibly fathom. The fear and paranoia that gripped me were palpable, leaving me constantly on edge, and I was determined to find answers, so I decided to attend the next neighborhood watch meeting. As I entered the community center, I felt the weight of just all the eyes that were clearly on me. The room was quiet as the members kind of exchanged these uneasy glances, but I thought maybe I was just reading too much into their body language. The meeting began with the usual updates and reports, but I couldn't help but notice the tension that was in the air. When it came time for new business, I mustered my courage and confronted the group about the harassment I'd been experiencing. I even went as far as to accuse the watch of having some sort of vendetta against me. I was met with a mixture of shock and sympathy and denial. Several members insisted that the watch had nothing to do with the incidents, while others suggested that perhaps I had made some enemies in the neighborhood and maybe those people were the ones causing me those issues. Now as the meeting ended, I felt a weird mixture of frustration and kind of hopelessness. It seemed that no one was willing to admit any wrongdoing or help me find the truth. I decided that if I wanted answers, I would have to find them on my own. Over the next few weeks, I conducted my own covert surveillance, so to speak, discreetly documenting the movements and actions of the watch members. One night, I ended up having to work late. When I pulled into my driveway, I noticed that the floodlight positioned right above my side door was on. Now feeling that hunch, I decided to leave my car parked in the road and quietly made my way to the side door. Now when I made it inside, I found two of my neighbors, who looked like they were trying to find something in my kitchen. I pulled out my cell phone and started recording a video, and I couldn't believe what I captured. My neighbors appeared to be planning something in my kitchen drawers. Thankfully in the video, you can clearly see and hear them discussing calling the cops. I remained hidden and allowed the two to leave my house. As I pieced together this weird puzzle, a chilling theory sort of emerged in my head. These neighborhood watch members believed that my unconventional appearance made me a threat to the community's image, and they had to take it upon themselves to get rid of me. Now, with the evidence that I now had with the phone video, I just confronted the police with it. Surprisingly, they were appalled by my findings and decided to take immediate action. The guilty members were not only removed from the neighborhood watch, but thankfully they were also arrested on several different charges. Now, with the truth out there, the neighborhood watch in my little town was completely disbanded. Not knowing if anyone else was involved with these two, I found it increasingly difficult to trust anyone within my now community. However, not long after this, the harassment completely stopped, and my life felt like it finally returned to normal. I had managed to expose all of this on my own, and the ordeal had made me stronger, I guess. In the end, my actions sparked a conversation within the neighborhood about tolerance and acceptance. 
people began opening up to one another, sharing their own experiences and perspectives, and as a result, our community became more inclusive and understanding. As for me, I decided to remain in the neighborhood, determined to be a force for positive change, even though I was kind of lazy and didn't want to leave. I even went as far as forming my own neighborhood watch, using my newfound sense of empowerment to help protect and actually uplift my fellow neighbors and community. Now, although the scars of those weeks would always still be there, they also served as a reminder of the strength and courage that can be found within each of us, even in the face of all the adversity that you might see. Now, my experience taught me that standing up for oneself and seeking the truth, no matter how difficult, weird, and sometimes scary the journey may be, can make a lasting impact on you and those around you. Back in 2019, I moved from the West Coast to a small town in upstate New York. The town had that charming feel that you would find almost in a Hallmark movie. Everyone seemed to be friendly and helpful, and I felt welcomed into the community soon after moving in. Now, a few months later, one of my neighbors went door to door informing everyone that there had been a theft from their shed, which was in their backyard. The supposed thief had stolen a weed whacker, lawnmower, and other outdoor tools. Although the news of the theft had left some of the neighborhood shocked and kind of scared, I didn't feel uncomfortable or really paranoid. Having lived in a rough neighborhood before, I was kind of desensitized to theft. However, I reassured my neighbors in a concerned voice that I would keep my eyes peeled for any sort of behavior like that. A couple of weeks went by without any further news of any sort of theft in the neighborhood until one afternoon when I got home from work. I found a flyer in my mailbox with the heading, Neighborhood Watch. The flyer wasn't really official, there's no official watch team, but rather a group of neighbors who wanted to get together to stop ongoing thefts. Confused as I had not heard or been notified of any other crimes in the area, I went next door and asked my neighbor Cliff if he had heard anything. Cliff was one of those kind of stoic types. He was in his early 70s and a widower. His wife, Irene, had passed away a few years before I moved into town. Even though Cliff was quiet, he was one of the nicest people I had met since moving there. He had helped me fix my car, dishwasher, dryer, and even installed a new sliding door for me after a storm knocked a tree through the previous one. I never asked him to do any of these things, but he always insisted, saying that it gave him a chance to get out of the house and be productive. I liked his calm and quiet demeanor as it reminded me of my dad. When I asked Cliff if he had heard anything about the ongoing crime, he kind of grumbled in his gruff voice, saying, I don't really know too much. I guess some punks have been breaking into sheds and stealing stuff. Nothing of mine has been stolen. I nodded and made some small talk with him before I started to walk down his driveway. When I was a few feet away, he shouted to me, Hey, just be careful. Make sure you lock your doors. I did hear that whoever's doing that is breaking into houses now, so... I smiled and thanked him for one last time. That night was no different from any other night. I made my dinner, had a few glasses of wine, and did some work on my computer. At around 11 that evening, I thought that I had heard something outside, like a cough or something. I made my way to the big window in my living room and looked through the blinds. Across the street, I saw one of my neighbors outside looking right at my house. It was strange and a little creepy, but I thought that he could have been just looking at the stars, so I just sort of dismissed it. A few minutes later, I couldn't shake that weird and horrible feeling in my stomach. I decided to get up and grab another glass of wine. My kitchen is in the back of the house and I have one of those big bay windows over the sink and counter that overlooks the backyard. I have a big yard that empties into a small wooded area. When I was pouring another glass, I happened to look out the window and I thought that I saw some movement. I shut the lights off in the kitchen so I wasn't visible from the outside. I cut my hands and looked through the glass of the window. To my disbelief, there was a person in my backyard looking at my house. I couldn't tell who it was as it was too dark and they were far enough away but it was undeniably a person. While I stood there in a sort of panic, the silhouette of the person started to jog towards my house. I jumped back, trying to process my thoughts. 
I decided to call the police, but my phone was in the other room. As I composed myself and started briskly walking toward the other room, I heard a loud bang upstairs. I froze again. In those brief seconds of panic, I heard heavy footsteps upstairs. I ran to the closet in the living room and hid underneath all the blankets. My phone was still on the other table and I didn't know what to do. At this point, I had no idea how many people were in my house and what kind of danger I truly was in. Within seconds of hiding, I could hear the heavy boots making their way down my hardwood steps. In a sheer stroke of luck, there was a knock on the door and the footsteps stopped abruptly. The boots sounded like they were right outside my door. Another knock on the door and this time was followed by the line, Hello? Is anyone home? This is the police. I heard the steps move a bit faster and stop in another room. By the sound, I could tell that the intruder was no longer near the closet door. With only one hope, I ran out of the closet into my front door. I opened it up and thankfully, it actually was a real police officer. I started to frantically plead that someone was in my house and I heard the steps go in that direction. The two officers began to run inside and in no time at all, they were escorting a man out of my house in cuffs. I felt sick as I stood and stared at the officers arresting the man, not because I had an intruder in my house, but because that intruder was Cliff, Cliff from next door. I was speechless as he walked by, mumbling some sort of nonsense to himself. While I was outside talking to the cops, I noticed the neighbor across the street whom I saw staring at my home and the other person whom I saw in the backyard come over to me. I immediately went into defense mode thinking that these two were part of the intrusion, but I couldn't have been more wrong. These two were on a late night walk and had seen Cliff going into my window upstairs. They called the police and were watching Cliff's movements upstairs. I guess they didn't want to bring attention to the situation in case I was in immediate danger. After an investigation, they found out that Cliff was the neighbor thief as well. He admitted to stealing all those belongings and breaking into my home. However, he never admitted what he had planned on doing inside my home that evening, which still kind of makes me sick thinking about it. I guess after his wife died and retiring from his job, he was bored and was looking for any form of excitement he could find. He found that rush from stealing and unfortunately that hunger, I guess, just kind of grew. And in hindsight, I'm thankful for our little makeshift neighborhood watch. If it hadn't been for my lovely neighbors, the end of this story could have been much different. My mother was the type of person who really depended on no one. That was until she had to have both of her legs amputated. She lived on social security and she was not a rich woman. When she came home from rehabilitation, my brother and I had to find someone to help her get up and ready in the morning, and also to put her to bed. She was fine during the day with her trusted wheelchair. My brother worked weird hours with the railroad, and I lived far away, so we were of no help. Luckily, she had a neighbor who was a caregiver, and had offered her services for $15 an hour. She did this professionally, and I couldn't believe our good luck. I would call my mother daily to check up on her, and she seemed to be just fine. One morning I had called, and she was crying, and she said that the caregiver's husband had been there that morning and tried to kiss her, and that he made her lie naked for a very long time, and it was cold. I told my mother how could that be true? Who would be trying to kiss an 80-year-old amputee? I also didn't hire an unexperienced man to take care of my mother. I called the woman and she said she had an emergency and that she had to have her husband come over and help her. I told the woman what my mom had told me and she and I agreed that maybe my mother had some dementia. She said that her husband would never do that, especially to a woman in her 80s with no legs. My mother then told me that she didn't want them in her house ever again. Then the woman quit on us the next day with no warning. I think she must have known he was a pervert. Maybe she was too. I unfortunately am very ashamed to admit that I didn't do any background checks. The next time I visited, 
I had went to their house to pay them what we owed them. This was the first time I had met the husband. The husband would not make any eye contact with me. I left with the feeling that my mother was probably right. Well, later in the year, the next time I visited, I heard that he was in jail for molesting his wife's granddaughters who were still in diapers. I will never ever stop feeling guilty for not believing my mother. Who the hell knows what he actually did to her? Did he drug her and molest her too? Did he go through her stuff? Did he try on her clothes? I hope that perverted bastard rots in jail, or the fellow prisoners hear what he did to the little girls and old women and give him a taste of his own medicine. I grew up living in rural Vermont. We had lived on a mountain road and there was a field behind our house that I often played. There were also woods on the far edge of the field, and if you went through them, this would take you to another field. The entire thing was fenced in, as cows were placed inside each summer. The field was owned by a local farmer. I often played with the cows, and I had also followed them through their various paths in the woods. One day, when I was around 12 years old, I was playing in the woods as normal, and I was riding on the back of one of the cows. She ambled slowly along, and I just casually rode along eating some blackberries that I had picked. She headed down a trail in the woods that I knew would bring us out of a clearing that I'd really enjoyed sitting in. When we popped out, I glanced over at the fence as it bordered the property of one of our neighbors. This man had always made me nervous. His hair was tangled into one big mass of a knot, and he smelled horrible. Unfortunately, he was outside in his yard, and he spotted me immediately. Now, he didn't own that field or the cows, so I wasn't too bothered. I just got down off the cow's back and began to poke around in the berry patch. Suddenly, I heard the twang of barbed wire fencing then being strained. I looked back, and the man was climbing over with a rifle. I quickly ran into the woods to hide, thinking he wouldn't follow me, but he did. I could hear the sounds of sticks cracking as he pursued me. I ducked under some branches to catch my breath, and I sat quietly as I could as my ears strained. He was definitely still out there, but I still had a lead on him. I knew that there was a spot a little further up where I could climb under the fence and then come out on the road. I made a break for it, and I climbed out of the pasture quickly. Once I was on the road, I stopped to look backwards, assuming I was now safe. The man stepped out of the woods, and he stood there pointing his gun right at me. I thought that I was going to die right on the spot. I then slowly walked backwards, watching him the entire time. Right in that moment, a vehicle came around the corner, and when I then turned to look at who it was as they drove by, I turned back to the man, and he was gone. I avoided that pasture for a very long time after that. I'm a 21-year-old male, and my girlfriend is 20. We rented out an apartment for a month. The area was secluded, and after dark, everyone would really just mind their own business. The neighbors would hardly even talk to each other, or even be outside in the evening. Our apartment was in a building with four floors, and each floor had a single apartment. All of the apartments were very compact and built to be rented to students. The night that we moved in, our taps ran out of water, so I had went upstairs hoping to borrow some from the people living upstairs. I had realized that two out of the four apartments were vacant, and they were also locked. The apartment on the fourth floor was lit from the inside, so I decided to ring the bell, but to my disappointment, nobody answered. Over the next week, we had gotten used to hearing the sound of someone whacking a rod, or some sort of metal on maybe the floor, or some other object. This was start late at night, after 1.30 a.m., and then continue for hours. Initially, we didn't really care about it, but after some time, it got us intrigued. 
The sound was clearly from one of the apartments above us, but as I already mentioned, two of the three apartments were vacant for sure, and the third one seemed vacant as well. But as I said, it was lit from the inside. I knocked on its door many times, but no one ever answered. The whacking sound was a daily occurrence, and on some very late nights, we could hear someone climbing the building stairs. It seemed as if we were the only ones living in this building, especially during the day and until the very late nights. We had made up theories just to try and convince ourselves that it was nothing, but the pattern of the whacking was way too irregular for it to be made by wind or something other than a person. It would start almost daily at around the same time. We had asked people around, but we didn't get any satisfactory answer. No one knew if anyone lived there. Towards the end of our stay, I saw a shady looking man going upstairs during the day. I asked him if he was the owner of the apartments upstairs. He said that he was, also including the one on the fourth floor. I asked him if anyone lived upstairs, and also about the strange whacking sound. He told me that no one did, and that he's actually looking for tenants. He also said that he had no idea about the sound. To my surprise, he then asked me, So how long are you going to stay here? Four more days. We're actually leaving on the 30th of this month. I replied. He asked me if anyone else had rented the place for the next month, and I told him that I didn't know. The strangest part is that for the next four days, there was neither the whacking sound, nor the sound of someone climbing up the stairs late at night. However, my girlfriend's internship got extended by two days, and we decided to stay there. And just as I had anticipated, the whacking sound resumed after the 30th, the day we were supposed to leave. I don't know what it was, I don't think I'll ever know, but I'm just happy that we got out of that place without any crazy consequences. It really freaked me out sometimes, and I even feel weird thinking about it, even now. This truly frightening story occurred more than a decade ago, just when I was about to head into my teenage years. My friend and I were wandering around in the neighborhood I was living in, as we always did. We had strayed several blocks from the house we were staying at, when two dogs started barking up a storm at us as we passed their house. They were pit bulls. The dogs were digging around the ground under their fence, where it was clear it had been a place they had escaped before. We could tell the dogs were about to break out, so my friend and I started running. As we saw the dogs get up under the gate and start coming at us, we went into this person's yard, and we shimmied up a tree which had branches for us to get up on. The dogs are now at the base of the tree barking, which made the owner of the yard we were in come out and then shoot the dogs away. As we were still in the tree, the owner, which looked to be about 50 years old, then started telling us to get into his garage so he could keep us safe. My friend and I just looked at each other, knowing between our eyes this was danger. We proceeded to tell him that we were okay and we were going to head home. Bun, he was at the base of the tree at this point, attempting to coax us into letting him help us down. The tone and mannerisms in the sky were truly sinister, and even as young boys, we could tell he was a predator. The man kept looking back and forth on the street, just to make sure that nobody was watching this go down. But eventually someone walking their own dog down the road came along, and I said that was my relative. We jumped down as the man backed up, and we then ran up to this person like we knew them. I always wonder what would have happened if we had actually let the man keep us safe. First of all, I just want to say that if you don't explicitly know someone in real life, do not but tell my parents. Unfortunately, I had gotten rid of any trace of Hannah 28 on Snapchat, so I was unable to show them what I was talking about. At the very most, they thought it was weird because I had no evidence to back up what I was saying. If only I'd kept those videos, I could have told my parents to call the cops. Well, my week went by without any more weird happenings and I couldn't be happier. But just a few weeks ago, 
I got a new notification on my Snapchat account, and I'm sure you can guess what it said. Hannah29 has added you. About two years ago, I rented a room in a three-bedroom house. The walls were very thin. My bedroom had one window, which led into the living room, none with outside access. This window will be important later on. There was three bedrooms, one for me, one for the master tenant, and one spare, which at the time was rented out by a pretty friendly guy. Well, friendly guy had issues with his work visa and had to move back to Canada last minute, leaving us about two weeks to find another roommate. Our quickest and easiest option was Craigslist. Due to my work schedule, I had no part in the selection process, but I was content when the new roommate moved in a bit later. Something was off about this guy, but he seemed friendly enough. He was a very tall, large man and was very quiet. Not somebody who I wanted to go out of my way to hang out with, but was still okay to be around. Two weeks after he moved in, the master tenant left for Hawaii, leaving me and the new tenant alone. For the first few days, things were normal. However, that all changed one night. I was woken up at about 8 a.m. to a frantic knocking on my door. The new roommate, we'll call him Kyle, was standing there when I opened up, looking frazzled. He looks me dead in the eye and asks, So do you want to tell me what was going on last night? To which I was shocked and confused. Last night I had come home from work at about 9pm and immediately showered and went to bed. I explained this to him and he says that he heard me screaming that he saw me through the window arguing with our landlord, who I had never met in person at this point. He claimed that he heard people coming in and out of our house. I tell him no way. None of that ever happened. After staring at me for a bit longer, he leaves. The next morning I wake up to the same thing. This time he says he saw me arguing with my boyfriend. I was single at the time. He said that he saw me talking with the master tenant, who as I mentioned before was in Hawaii. He also asked me for the badge number of the officer I was talking to. Apparently he saw a bunch of police as well. This time I get angry, and I more or less tell him to cut this shit out. I'm not doing anything, and I have no idea what you're talking about. He got this weird look on his face, and said, I think I had a seizure in my sleep. Next time that happens, call the ambulance. After that, he left. But about an hour later, he begins knocking at my door again. When I open up, Kyle repeats the same exact story verbatim. I tell him to leave me alone, and then I left for work. My workday went about as expected. I'm a bit reluctant to return home, but I was too tired to crash at somebody else's place. Big mistake. At about 1 a.m., I wake up to door slamming. Kyle is pacing back and forth between his bedroom and the living room, then to the front door, walking in and out of each room, turning the lights on and off, mumbling angrily to himself. I can see his shadow pacing back and forth through the frosted window in my room. Since my room is dark, he can't see inside. Suddenly he screams, I can't live like this anymore. Why are you doing this to me? I thought he was on the phone, so I didn't respond. A few moments later, he screams my name. I then realized his statements were directed at me. I knew I had to get out of there, so I quietly crept out of bed and start getting dressed, packing up bags of clothes for work in the morning. I'm almost done when he screams. 
I can hear you. He then charges over to my room, slapping the wall next to my door, but not touching the door itself. I look toward my window, and I see his shadow lean all the way forward, pressing his ear against the glass. I was fucking terrified, and I sat completely still, not moving a muscle. He eventually screams my name again and moves away from the window. I hear him start pacing between rooms again. Now my shoes are kept on a rack outside my door and not inside my room, so I know that when I leave, I'm going to need a moment to put them on. I decided to wait until he was back in his room, at which time I plan to grab my shoes, put them on, and run. As I'm formulating this plan, the pacing stops. He then screams. Do you want to fight about this? Come on out right now, and we'll fight, I swear to God. Now, I am a very small girl, and only five feet tall. This guy is easily three times my size, so I'm definitely not looking to fight. After a few minutes, he turns off all the lights, and I hear the door to his room open and close. followed by silence. I wait for a moment to be sure I can't hear any movement, and then I decided to take my chance. I took a breath and opened my door quickly, then stepped out and grabbed my shoes, before looking up a second later to see him standing there in the dark hallway with nothing but a pair of boxers and socks on. He then spoke in a low, calm voice. Ma'am, we need to talk. That was a hard no from me, so I grabbed my shoes and ran out the front door with them in hand. I ran about half a block barefoot before stopping and putting them on. When I looked behind me, I saw him standing in the porch light of our front door, watching me run, but not moving. Luckily for me, I had a friend who lived about two blocks away, and I had their spare key on me. So I let myself in and crashed there for the night, and that's where I stayed for the next week, while we worked things out with our landlord. Kyle agreed to move out within the week. He said he didn't remember anything that happened, and wasn't sure if it was real or not. But if I said that's what went down, then it must be true. The day Kyle left, he sent me a photo of the house keys sitting on the table along with a message that said, I'm out. I take a friend over there with me to scout it out, and to make sure he actually left. When we got there, we discovered that not only did he leave a bunch of food and furniture behind, but he had ripped out all the fire alarms from the ceiling, and had unscrewed and removed the deadbolt from the front door, and left them lined up neatly on the front table. The door to my bedroom can only be locked by using a key from the outside, and had been locked when we arrived, which meant that Kyle still had a key to my room. We called the locksmith right away. Even after the locks were changed, I was still terrified to stay there alone, and never went to sleep at night without barricading the doors with chairs and other furniture. To this day I still fear for his safety. He obviously had some kind of psychological condition, but I also wonder what could have happened to me if I hadn't been as lucky as I was. A few weeks ago, I had to fly out to a small town I had never been to in order to look for a place to live. I'm moving there in the fall to start grad school. My boyfriend flew with me, before the trip, I researched all sorts of apartments on Craigslist and set up a bunch of appointments. Our first appointment was in the afternoon, in this sort of remote residential area. The landlord sounded fine over email and asked me to call him about an hour before the appointment to confirm that I was still coming. I called, but he didn't answer. So my boyfriend and I started walking to the house and just hoped that he would show up. 
About ten minutes before the appointment, the guy calls me. Hey, are you coming? He sounded like an older man and had this very strange, slow way of talking. But I just thought he was older. Yes, we're in front of the house now. He then got extremely upset. We? Oh yeah, my boyfriend's with me. You never told me you had a boyfriend. You never said that. It had never crossed my mind to tell him this information, since my boyfriend would not be coming to live with me. He was just helping me look for apartments on the trip. I told the man, and after a very long pause, he said, I'm sorry. It's just... Sometimes, people don't tell me when they're married, and it surprises me. I'll see you soon. He then hung up. I told my boyfriend about what the man said, and he was immediately weirded out. He wanted to leave. But there were slim pickings in terms of real estate. So I, stupidly, said that we had to stay, in case this was the place. As we were discussing this, we see a man leave the house we were going to view. This man was young and extremely sketchy looking. He took one look at us and ran to his car and pulled away from the curb with a screech. Okay, so now we're really starting to get creeped out. But this isn't enough for us to just bail. Yet. Me and my boyfriend looked at each other wondering what to do. Soon, the landlord arrives. He looked to be in his fifties, very tall and strong looking. His eyes were completely blank and devoid of emotion. He slowly walks up to us and says, I would shake your hands, but mine are dirty. Where from? My boyfriend asks. Work. He flatly responds. He then asked me a lot of questions, completely ignoring my boyfriend. What am I going to school for? What other places am I considering for living? Is my boyfriend moving to this town as well? The entire time, he stares into my eyes without blinking. I try to give him answers that are as vague as possible. Meanwhile, my boyfriend is asking the landlord the same kind of questions, which he refuses to answer any of them. He then says out of nowhere, Let me show you the basement. At this point we really should have left, but we didn't. I kept thinking that this was an eccentric old man from a small town, and we're city folk, and he was just feeling paranoid. My boyfriend, on the other hand, wanted to get out of there, but he followed us, as the man led us to the back of the house, away from the street to this sort of detached shed. He opened the door, and we saw that there were stairs leading down into utter darkness. He flipped the switch at the top of the stairs, and the light did not turn on. Normally, the response for this would be, oh shit, the light's out, or something like that. But he just says, hmm and slowly walked down into the darkness. He then just stood there, without moving, in the dark, then said, Aren't you coming down? Uh, there's nothing to see if the light's out, says my boyfriend. The landlord just stands there for a long time, then slowly walks back up the stairs and closes the basement door, without saying anything. He took us into the house. Weird and increasingly creepy things ensued. The front door, the only exit to the house, locked automatically. When my boyfriend tried to fiddle with it, the man became very upset and told him to leave it alone. He managed to get it open secretly though. The man kept trying to box us into small rooms and kept reaching his hands into his pockets only to take them away when he caught us looking. On Craigslist and in person, 
The man claimed that there was a grad student already living in the house, but the evidence of that seemed arranged. There were neat piles of generic textbooks on the table, but not things a 20-something-year-old might read. There was a bowl of fruit on the table, but there was no other food in the fridge or pantry, or even utensils. There were maybe three t-shirts in the closet, and the landlord couldn't say what school he went to or how long he had been renting the house. Finally, the man had showed us every single room except for one. He claimed that the one he refused to open for us was just the attic, and we didn't need to see anything up there. He gave us several reasons when we inquired. It was unfinished. There was furniture up there. It would smell bad. The last one I believed, because when I stood near the door, it smelled terrible. After a while, we made our excuses and got out of there. The man walked us out, then got into his car, but when he thought we had turned the corner, he exited his car and slowly sauntered back into the house. My boyfriend, fixated on the idea that there was something off about this guy, googled him that night. We found out three things. That he was a pillar of the community, known by a lot of the townspeople. There was no evidence of him owning or managing real estate, as he claimed on Craigslist. And that he had listed his home address as the very house we had been touring. So that was definitely the creepiest thing that's ever happened to me. This was the first and only time I ever used Craigslist. It was about five years ago. In the springtime, when the snow was all melted and the grass was starting to grow long again, I went to my garage to get the lawn mower. I had an old push mower and it hadn't been used in months. When I wheeled it out of my garage, it wouldn't start. I couldn't figure out the problem and after researching online with no luck, I realized I probably needed to buy a new one. The one I had was really old anyways and it had had some problems in the past. My yard is not all that big, so I only needed another push mower, and I figured they wouldn't be too expensive to buy a used one. I went to Craigslist and searched in my local area for lawn mowers. After browsing for a little while, I found one that seemed to be the best deal. It was $100, and it seemed like a reasonable price to me. After some thought, I decided to reach out and let the seller know that I was interested in buying it. I texted the number that was on the listing and received a response about an hour later. The response said that if I wanted to buy the mower, I could come by and purchase it tomorrow night. I agreed, and I was then provided with an address and a time to pick it up, which was 8 p.m. This was a little later than I would have liked, but I agreed. The next night, I drove my small SUV to the address that I was sent, and I texted the seller letting them know that I was on my way. I got a text back saying, Sounds good, the mower's in the garage. Come right in. It took me almost 20 minutes to get there, and it was a little bit farther than I wanted. When I arrived, it seemed to be a pretty typical residential neighborhood. There were a bunch of houses along both sides of the street. I saw the address of the house that I was going to. The garage door was open, and I parked my car on the side of the street. I texted the seller that I had arrived. I waited in my car until I got a response. It took about a minute, but the seller said, Come on up. I got out of my car, walked across the street, and then up the driveway. When I got inside the garage, it was not very well lit. There was just a dim light bulb in the middle. I looked around and there was miscellaneous stuff that you would typically find in a garage, but there was no lawnmower. I took a few more steps in and called out, Hey, I'm here. I didn't hear anything. I saw the normal step up to the door leading to the house, but then I saw another door. It was in the far back right corner, and this was a door that was open and seemingly leading into another hallway. I saw a piece of a cardboard box was propped up against the door, and written in marker it said, Lawn Mower, and then had an arrow pointing inside the door. I was a little confused by this, and it seemed a little bit sketchy, but I walked over to it. When I got to the doorway, things were pretty dark, and I couldn't see well, but I did see that there was a door to the right and then a staircase going straight down to seemingly a basement. The arrow was pointing down the stairs, so maybe this guy had his lawnmower in the basement for some reason. I started walking down the stairs to the basement area. When I made it to the bottom of the stairs, I could now see that the entire basement appeared to be unfinished, and the lighting wasn't much better in there either. Still, I didn't see a lawnmower. Then, I heard noise coming from up the stairs. 
It was the door from the garage leading to the basement, and it was closing. It wasn't slammed or anything. It was closed relatively quietly, but I still heard it. I looked up the staircase, but didn't see anybody. Whoever had closed the door closed it from the outside. I suddenly had a really bad feeling, and I just wanted to leave. I walked back up the stairs as quickly as I could. As I was making it to the top of the stairs, I heard another door close, and then footsteps. Somebody else was in the house. It sounded like they had gone in the other door leading from the garage. I tried opening the door to the garage, but it was somehow locked from the outside. I couldn't open it. Then I tried the other door leading to inside the house. That one was already open a crack. When I made it inside the rest of the house, I saw that I was in some sort of hallway. It was small and led to a living room type of area that had a sliding glass door that went out to a back patio. I heard footsteps approaching from another room around the corner. Without hesitating, I went to the sliding glass door and opened it. Once outside, I shut it behind me, just in time to see a man coming into view inside the house. I didn't get a good look at him at all, but he was walking in my direction at a rather fast speed. I bolted out of there, sprinting all the way from the backyard to around the house and garage and all the way back to my car. When I made it inside my vehicle, I started the engine and immediately left. I drove all the way back home, and then I blocked the number just because I didn't want anything to do with that guy. I reported my experience on the Craigslist website and then decided to buy a new lawnmower from the store. Since then, I haven't used Craigslist. I'm not sure if I'll use it again sometime. Maybe things have changed. All I know is, I will never forget that experience I had, and I hope to never have one like that again. Last year, I broke my leg and was unable to do a lot of things that I typically do. I live alone in a smaller house, and my friends and family were really nice in helping me out when I first got the crutches. Soon after, though, I realized that I would have to do yard work, and I didn't want to ask family or friends to do it. Everybody in my neighborhood takes great pride in their yards. The lawns are all very green and trimmed often. There's generally nice flowers in most as well. I have a typical garden, just some basic flowers by the house, and then most of my front yard is just grass that I cut weekly. I decided to go on Craigslist to find somebody to keep up my yard for a few weeks until I would be able to again. There was only three weeks until I would be able to do yard work, and I didn't want to hire a company because I knew that would be really expensive. I found an ad on Craigslist that said, male, just graduated from high school, looking to earn money doing odd jobs during summer. He even listed yard work in the ad, and I figured this would be a good person to go with. I contacted the kid, whose name was Michael. He responded, saying that he was excited to have a job for a few weeks, and I told him he would come over once a week. The job would be cutting the grass and watering the flowers, also cutting down weeds if there were any, and picking up sticks in the yard. Probably would only take an hour or two each week. The next week, Michael arrived at my house, and I went outside to greet him. Right away, though, things seemed strange. Michael did not appear to be in high school at all. He had a full beard for starters, and I know some high schoolers can grow full beards, but he just didn't look 18 or 19, more like 29 or 30. Right away I said to Michael that I thought he said he had just graduated high school. He looked confused for a moment and then said that he looks a little older than he actually is. He admitted that he hadn't just graduated, but claimed he forgot to change his ad for a few years. More like 10 years, I thought. Still, he looked capable of doing the work, and he was already here, so I gave him the information that he needed, and he started working. I went inside and went over some work stuff. I was working part-time at home and part-time in the office at the time. Occasionally, I would glance out the window to see what Michael was doing. The first day went pretty well. He did all of the maintenance work in about an hour, and then I paid him and he left. The next week was a bit different. There was the same amount of work to be done, if not less, but he was there for almost three hours. I wasn't quite sure why he took so long, because I wasn't paying him by the hour. But finally, he finished, I paid him, and he left. The next week, which was the last one, he was there for a lengthy amount of time again, and this time, I noticed him poking around some of the windows and areas of my house from the outside. I really didn't know what he was doing. Cleaning the windows was not part of the job. That's seemingly what he was doing, though. I was careful not to let him notice me when I watched him work, but seeing this was a little confusing. At last, he was done, and I paid him for the final time, and he left. I was glad to be done working with Michael. He was a little strange and definitely misrepresented himself. But that same night, at about midnight, I was still awake and on my phone in my bedroom. I'm a bit of a night owl, and I frequently stay up past midnight. I heard the sound of a window opening at the opposite end of my house. Immediately, I knew it was happening. I just knew it had to be Michael. 
Looking back, I could have been wrong, but I had more than a hunch. I didn't know what he wanted or what he was trying to do, but when I suddenly heard footsteps coming into the house, I knew I had to do something. I stepped out into my hallway, just a couple of steps. Then, I shouted as loud as I could that I knew it was Michael and I had a gun. I didn't have a gun, but I wanted to scare him off. It actually worked, and I heard footsteps moving back until I heard noises around the window again. I left my room and walked into the living room to see an open window. I went to the front of my house and saw what sure enough appeared to be Michael running out of the front yard and onto the street. I made sure that all my windows and doors were closed, then I went back to bed. The next day, I went to the police with all of my information. It was not difficult at all for them to find Michael because his ad was still on Craigslist. I'm glad I was awake that night when he tried breaking in, or I'm not sure what would have happened. Do you know how they say that hindsight is 2020? Well, looking back on that day, the more I think about what happened, all of the signs were there from the beginning. It was 2006. I had just turned 24 and finally got in a home for myself. It wasn't anything fancy, just a small one bedroom home, but it was a home and I was proud of it. I had just graduated from college and landed a solid job at a small accounting firm so I finally had a way to earn some money. That being said, I was still in the process of saving up, so at the time, I was essentially living paycheck to paycheck, like most people. In order to make a little bit of extra money, I was in the process of selling things that I didn't need anymore, a lot of which was being sold over Craigslist. I had managed to sell a few cheap paintings and piece of furniture that I owned on the site, so I figured it was a good place to start. I posted a few items, and it wasn't long before I had a response. Someone had emailed me about buying an old cell phone, and as luck would have it, they were able to meet that day. I didn't like the idea of meeting at my house or at their house, so I asked if they would mind meeting at a local diner. He agreed, and we were set up to meet later that day. The time came, and I grabbed the phone and his charger, got in my car, and made the 15-minute drive to the diner. As I pulled in, I noticed that it wasn't as full as I expected it to be, which was nice, and I didn't think anything of it at first. But the more I tell this story, the more I realize that I noticed a white Ford Taurus parked next to a red Chevy Impala. As I said, I didn't think anything was strange about it at the time. I pulled into a parking spot that was close to the door, and I texted the buyer to let him know that I was there. He said he would be at the diner in a few minutes. So I just turned on some music and waited. After a few moments, a white Ford Taurus pulls into the spot next to me and me and the buyer made the exchange. Everything went fine. We both said thank you and headed our separate ways. As I made my way home though, I noticed something odd. I had made a few turns along the way and I could swear that I was being followed by a red car. Again, I made no connection to the car in the parking lot. As I got closer to my house, I grew more and more concerned that something was wrong. However, one intersection away from my house, I noticed the car turned down one of the side roads. I was relieved to make it home, safe and sound. I made my way into the house and made sure to lock the door behind me. I threw some leftovers into the microwave and got ready to settle down for the night. After dinner, I hopped into the shower and began to get ready for bed. I would have gone to sleep as if nothing was wrong had I not remembered that I left the curtains to the living room open. I don't like the idea of someone being able to see inside my house, so I went to close them. I paused when I got to the window though because I could have sworn I saw something in the road. It was at that moment I realized that I was looking at a car that had parked at the end of my driveway. I froze. My first instinct was to look to the door, and it was still locked, thankfully. I then quickly made my way over to the light switch to the front porch, and I could see the car as clear as day. It was the red car that had been following me, a red Chevy Impala. To my horror, the car was empty. I didn't know how many people there were, or where they were, 
but someone was outside my house for some reason. I pulled my phone out and quickly called the police. I explained to the 911 operator what the issue was and they assured me that someone was on the way and asked me to stay on the line. That was when I heard them, the sound of multiple people walking along my porch. I turned out my light, but it didn't scare them away. I tried to poke my head around the corner to the window without being seen, hoping that I could catch a glimpse of who was outside. To my horror, one of the men was standing with his covered face pressed against the glass trying to look inside. As soon as my head came around the corner, we made eye contact. He didn't move at first. All I could think to do was to say, Police are coming. You better get out of here right now. I tried to sound stern, but I honestly probably sounded like a sniveling child. It was like clockwork, though, and almost right after I finished my sentence, I could see the flashing lights coming down the road. The dispatcher wasn't lying. Someone was actually right down the road. The men noticed the lights and took off to their car, but they didn't make it in time. The police were in the driveway and the three men were taken into custody. I recognized one of them as the man who was driving the white Ford Taurus. The police said, this sort of thing happens all of the time. I worked at a gas station in my small North Carolinian town 10 miles from Charlotte. I was a 39-year-old wife and a mother of three daughters. I was a stay-at-home mom, and my daughters were all in school. And at the time, my family really needed a little extra income. The area was predominantly safe. My hours were 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. My duties were being a cashier, of course, stocking products, cleaning, doing nightly audits, and reading every Dean Koontz novel I could get my hands on. All of this by myself, I should add. The company didn't feel a need for a second person on this shift because it was really slow, but on weekends, very hectic. I handled this job like a pro. I really loved seeing my regulars at night and the morning workers getting their coffee and heading to work. I was at this gas station, which was also a bit of a convenience store, for about a year. I did have the -the run-of-the-mill meth heads who liked their sweets. The home was looking for freebie 6 or somewhere to charge their phone. I also had the occasional local police officers that would come in at around 12 to 1 a.m. for free coffee and bitch about their shift. On this particular night, I was reading the Dean Koontz novel Intensity. I put the bookmark in because I felt like moving around. I went around the counter to the 5-hour energy shots and I began to organize and stock. I heard the bell above the door like I had a million times before. I had so many regulars, ranging from pizza delivery guys to EMTs. I was setting the case of five-hour energy shots down to help this customer when I felt something cold and hard against my right shoulder blade. My first instinct was that this was a cruel prank from a regular. I turned around to say so when I was then met with a gun pointing at my forehead. It was an African-American guy with a bandana on half of his face. I immediately put my hands up in shock. I looked around and I saw that there were three more guys in different colored bandanas with no gun but looking nervous and then demanding me to give all the money. I walked around the counter with this guy holding his gun right to my head and telling me, Hurry up! Give me the money! Open the register! I said with my hand still in the air and shaking, Yes, yes, of course, here. And I opened up the register for him. The other four guys descended on this register, getting all the cash in the register. Suddenly the gunman looked at me, then said, This register too, bitch. There was a second register that had the bare minimum for the first shift to open up with. I put in my code, and I opened that register as well. They cleaned out that one, too. They then saw the safe underneath the first register, and again, the gunman pointed his gun to my temple and also demanded I open the safe. 
I said in a shaky voice that the safe is on a timer. If you press one button, whether it be for the $10 bills or a roll of quarters, it won't dispense again for a whole two minutes. The guys were all on the safe pressing buttons, while in the meantime, I'm praying out loud for God to spare me, because I have a husband and children that need me. I kept frantically saying this prayer, and the guys were all frustrated that the safe wasn't giving them what they wanted. I heard one of the guys saying, One of you shut that bitch up! And another said, Just shoot her already! We already have what we need! Right at that statement, I could literally feel I was about to lose my bladder and pee all over myself. Even though I was scared out of my mind, I was also mad as hell that this was possibly going to be where I ended up. I held in that pee, and I just watched as they started to steal as many cigarettes, wraps, and black and miles as they could. One of the guys then yelled, We've been here too long. Let's go. Let's get the hell out of here. Three of them were sprinting out the door, while one was in front of me, all while I was shaking with clenched hands praying. I looked up, and then his bandana fell down. I thought this was it for me, but he then just smiled at me, and he joined his friends. At the very same time, a woman came inside to buy a soda. They yelled at her too, pointing the gun at her to give them her purse. The lady replied back with, I'm not giving you my purse, motherfucker, and I thought for sure they would get aggressive. Instead, however, they seemed to just be worried about being there too long. They then ran out the door and scattered through the parking lot. I looked at the lady, then the glass door, and I could see her partner's truck sitting outside. I told her to go to her truck while I called the police. I then locked the door as soon as she was in the truck. I picked up the store's landline and I dialed 911. I ran to the stockroom and I locked that door as well. I told the 911 operator of all the details she needed and after only a couple of minutes, she said it was safe to go to the front door for the officers. And I did just that. I unlocked the door, and I immediately removed my name tag and threw it in the trash. I felt like this was finally over, and I was obviously quitting. I saw the woman customer that was confronted by the gunman just shaking, and she was rocking back and forth. I put my hand on her shoulder, as she also gave her own statement to the police. I gave the officers my statement, and I called my manager. She came to the store along with CSI investigators. I had to watch myself on tape at least three times with the investigators. At one point, a CSI guy paused the video while the thieves were surrounding the safe and their back was turned, and he asked me, Ma'am, why didn't you run? Because I was afraid I'd be shot in the back, I said. The man apologized immediately, realizing how traumatized I really was. After the police left, I continued to converse with my manager as she tried to console me. She then called her manager because she had never been through anything like this. I actually heard upper management tell her, Oh, she'll be alright. No need for me to get out of bed for this. I literally lost it and I told her she was a piece of shit. I eventually went home, and around this time it's four in the morning. I race upstairs, and I kiss all my children on their foreheads. I then went to mine and my husband's bedroom, and I went into our bathroom to wash my face. I was thinking in my head that I didn't want to wake him up, because he has another hour to sleep before shift for his job begins. I couldn't help but to break down after realizing I was alive and that I was now at home splashing water on my face. My husband woke up to this, and he asked in a slight panic, What's wrong, babe? What's going on? I broke down to my knees on my bathroom floor, and I then explained my entire nightmare night to him. He held me and consoled me. I stayed up until it was time to take my children to school. When I got back home, I called the company's HR. They were very cold towards me, I then decided to call a workers' compensation lawyer. After discussing what happened to me on my third shift all by myself, as well as the HR being so cold towards me, he took my case. 
I discovered that the four guys that robbed me at gunpoint were all 16 years old. I don't know what punishment they ever received, but I do know that I got one year of unemployment checks, as well as a settlement of $25,000. I also received therapy for the PTSD that I now have. It took about a year for me to be able to go to a gas station all on my own. It's been about four years since, and I'm doing okay now. That is, as long as I have my two knives and a taser with me. Back in the summer of 2020, I was at home playing video games with a buddy of mine when I realized I didn't have any booze left. Pretty much all I did during the pandemic was drink and play video games. Please don't judge me. Anyway, I decided to drive to the local gas station just a few minutes away from my house. As I walked into the gas station, I had noticed four men, four very large men and they were being very loud and obnoxious by the gas pumps. They must have been pretty drunk too, because they were being so rowdy, and two of them seemed to be stumbling around their truck. Now, this wasn't an abnormal sight, as my town's full of rednecks who drink way too much. Anyway, I went into the gas station, and I went over to the liquor section, and I had grabbed my choice of beverage. As I was grabbing my drink, The men had come in to pay for their gas, or whatever they were buying. The cashier was a young, attractive girl. She must have also been new because I frequented that gas station a lot, and I had never seen her there before. As the men were paying for their things, they had started to say very sexual things to the girl. I could tell it was making her uncomfortable. I won't repeat them, as they're just really not worth saying but they began asking her what time she got off and which car was hers. I could see that she was starting to shake and she could barely get the change out of the register. I really felt terrible for her and I then shouted, Hey, just pay for your things and leave. Now my mouth had acted before my brain could process that these men had not only outnumbered me, but they were almost twice my size. I'm a male, and I'm about six feet tall and decently built, but if these men decided not to play nice with me, I stood no chance at all. After I blurted out for them to leave, they all turned and looked at me. It was then that I realized the situation that I had just put myself in, and my heart dropped into my stomach. By the pure grace of God, they simply shot a pissed off glance at me, nodded, and then left. I then approached the counter, asking the young girl if she was okay. She was still shaking, but she said yes. I asked her if she wanted me to call the police for her, but she said no, and that her manager was in the back. I just said okay, and I paid for my things. I looked out the window, and luckily the big rusty truck the men came from was now gone. I did a quick jog to my car, making sure they weren't parked around the corner of the building and they weren't. I was able to make it home to enjoy some drunken video games with my friends. So fellas, if you are ever in the position to stop sexual harassment, do it. Just make sure you aren't possibly going to get your ass kicked in the process. Lately, I have been rethinking my career choice. I currently work as a location manager in the city where I live. For those people who may not specifically know what I mean when I say location manager, it just means that I'm responsible for finding locations for directors to film and secure locations for film production. I know it may not seem like a glorious job, but this industry is crazy, and I had to secure any job that I could get. I love movies and the entire entertainment industry, and it has always been a dream to work in this field one way or another. Well, as it turns out, I was quite good at being a location manager. Over time, I was able to build up a little bit of credibility, which made it much easier to secure locations. I worked on a bunch of films for the last several years, some bigger than others, but mostly low-budget films. During my time doing this, I met a ton of famous actors and influential people in the industry. At this point, you're probably wondering why I would be rethinking my career choice. Everything seems super cool. The simple answer is, this world of film and entertainment burns you out quicker than anything else. 
However, that is not the main reason why I've been truly rethinking my career. In actuality, the straw that broke the camel's back is much darker and more sinister. The last movie I worked on was not a great movie, plain and simple. Everybody is entitled to their opinions, of course, but objectively speaking, this was one of those ultra-sappy movies that you find on the Hallmark Channel, and it just felt uninspired. I will say, though, that the crew on this production was amazing. I love the writers and directors, and even some of the actors. We ended up getting to know each other and going out on a couple of occasions. The beauty of working on these smaller productions is that you really get to form a bond with a lot of the crew, which is something I imagine doesn't happen on massive Hollywood film sets. One of the extras in the film, who had a handful of lines, started to hang out with me quite a bit. Her name was Hannah, and like a lot of extras, she was, and I believe still is, an inspiring actress. Hannah is someone that I would describe as remarkably beautiful. When she walked into a room, heads would turn, and that's not even an exaggeration. When the director met her, he was so blown away that he gave her a very minor part in the movie. She literally had like five lines, but I assume that's sort of a big deal for your first movie. In the several weeks that we worked on the movie, Hannah seemed to take a liking to me, which, at first, I was really into. After Hannah's small part, she stuck around with me and helped me. She basically was an unofficial assistant to me and helped me with day-to-day -day tasks, and I made sure that I was able to get her paid for her efforts. Like any production, towards the end of shooting, tensions can get a bit high and people can get short with you. However, what happened on our last day of production was something altogether different. Often on film sets, filming can take place overnight, and that was the case for this final day of production. Hannah was on location with me just helping, but she didn't seem like herself. Hannah was always upbeat and excited, but tonight she was in another world. She was quiet, dismissive, and kind of rude for lack of a better word. I'm not sure exactly what time it was, but it was sometime in the middle of the night. We had a small crew of art department guys setting up the location. I was there basically just overseeing everything and Hannah was there just helping me. The director and the actors for the scene were there, but they were all resting in the back room in the building while we were filming inside. When the art guys finished, they all headed out and it got to be just myself and Hannah awake in this location. In all the years I've worked on movies, I had never seen such a light crew. You could tell the feelings and vibes of this project just weren't all there. I tried making conversation with Hannah and joking around with her, but all my efforts sort of just failed. She just kept brushing me off and I honestly didn't really care. I figured once we wrapped the film up, I would never see her again. While I was awkwardly just walking around the set, I heard Hannah shout for me and it sounded like it was coming from a distance. Seconds ago, she was right next to me, so I found it weird that she was in the next room. I rushed in there to make sure that she was okay and when I got in there, she was standing in the back of the room with the lights off. I could only barely see her. The only lights were the lights shining into the room from the doorway I was now standing in. Hannah? Are you alright? What's going on? I said with genuine concern. She just smiled at me and said in an almost seductive voice, and yet it still sounded off. She said, Hi. I have something for you. Well, as you may expect, my mind was racing. I had a feeling that maybe this girl had an interest in me, and now she wanted me to join her in this room alone. I slowly approached her because I was still feeling some apprehension about all of this for some reason. When I got about five feet away from her, I noticed her hand behind her back. I stopped and asked, What do you got behind your back? You're not going to stab me, are you? I laughed, trying to make light of the strange situation. At that moment, Anna started to cry and sob uncontrollably. I didn't know what I did to upset her. Before I could say anything, she shouted, I liked you so much, and all you ever cared about was a stupid movie. I hate you. As I tried to take all of that in, she threw a knife from behind her back onto the ground and ran right through me and knocked me off my feet. My heart was beating out of my chest at this point, and when I approached the wall where I was standing, I looked down and it was in fact a knife. A real knife. For some reason, I never reported this to the director or the authorities. I have no idea why. I just figured since nothing happened, I'm better off just leaving it alone. The more time that passes, the more I think about that night. What would have happened if I kept walking toward her? Would she have stabbed me or was it all just a trick? 
If it wasn't the middle of the night, would she have even tried anything like this? And perhaps most horrifying, I have no idea where she is or where she went. She's got no social media anymore. I looked and no other film credits, at least that I could find. This industry is crazy, man. You meet a lot of strange people who sometimes just aren't all there. Hannah, for example, is a sweet, beautiful girl, and one night, I don't know if it was the sleep deprivation or all the hours we were working, but she just lost it. I think the highs and lows of this industry have always taken enough toll on me. As I've stated, I assume she's probably still trying to act, probably under another name, but honestly, this poor girl has some inner demons, and it wouldn't surprise me one bit if the demons in her head won. In my mid-twenties, I was trying to figure out a lot of aspects of my life, and I was trying to get my future in order. I was never objectively a bad person, but somehow, I always seemed to fall through the cracks. I finished near the bottom of my class with my GPA, never went to college, and experimented with some extracurricular things that you could say are illegal. I was never in trouble, but I also never brought anything of substance to the table. I was about a month away from my 26th birthday when I met Janelle, and that's when I decided it was time to use my brain and become a decent member of society instead of a burnout. Due to my disturbing resume or lack thereof at this point in my life, I was finding it very hard to find a job. Even jobs that you may think anybody can get, I wouldn't even get a call back. Even if I went out of my way to reach back out to them to follow up on applications, I still would never have my call returned. It hit me hard. Just as I was about to give up, like I always did, Janelle found me an amazing job. Not glamorous by any means, but for someone like me it was amazing. The job was for an overnight warehouse worker. I would work from 9pm until 6.30am loading up pallets with boxes. Though the main premise sounds simple enough, and it was, physically the job was tough. We never had enough help and it was extremely hard to keep help once we would get workers in the door. I found myself a lot of time working alone until finally the company downsized. We started to work until 4.30 in the morning instead of 6.30 and the little help that we had was spread thin. When I was working, I would put headphones on and just get into the zone. I didn't bother talking to anybody or even getting to know anyone because chances are I wouldn't be seeing them in a week or two and honestly, talking just distracted me and I was all about getting my job done. One night when I was nearing the end of my shift, I noticed a small looking man standing about 5 feet away from me. I didn't say anything at first because I figured it was a new employee just watching how I was doing things. When I finished, I took my headphones and asked the guy if he needed anything, and he responded, Yeah, man, I hate to ask, but I was wondering if I could get a ride home. I found it weird considering I had no idea who this guy was and didn't even recognize his face as one of the workers. Being the kind of guy that I am, I told him that I would for some gas money. He responded almost nervously and said, Yeah, yeah, man, of course, I, I got you. I told the guy to give me a few minutes to grab my things and punch out of my shift and to meet me outside. He nodded and agreed. I felt weird about the situation, but I'd been in his shoes before, I kept telling myself. I told one of the other guys when I was punching out that I had to give the weird new guy a ride home, and the other employees made a strange face and asked, The new guy? I don't remember seeing a new guy. We both shrugged it off, just assuming that's how this place operates these days. I went outside a few minutes later and saw the strange guy waiting next to my car. What I didn't find alarming then, and I wish I would have, was that I'd never told the guy which car I drove and yet he was already waiting by my car. We started to drive, and right away things were getting weird. I asked him where he lived and he gave me some vague and confusing answer. Uh, I live on Maple Drive, well, well no, not, not anymore, I, I live uh, near the park. You know, Rose Park by the edge of the city? I nodded and said, Okay, man, near the park. Where near the park? I just, just want to know where I'm dropping you off, dude. The man said nothing for a few seconds and then said, Just near the park. Head towards the park and I'll tell you where to go. I'm still kind of in awe of my stupidity as I write this. You have to understand at this point in my life I really didn't care about much and just wanted to get from point A to point B in my day-to-day -day life. I didn't question really anything. 
When we got close to the park, the man finally spoke up. Turn here. I stopped the car for a moment and said to the guy, Are you sure? This doesn't really look like a street. The man just kept saying, Yeah, in his shaky voice as he nodded intently. Against my better judgment, I turned down the long, dark path. This was for sure not a road. It was a dirt path and I couldn't see anything. I turned on my high beams and thankfully it was just in time. Obstructing the road in front of me was a massive fallen tree. Oh, dude. Ugh. Ugh. Looks like we're gonna have to go another way or something. I'm not getting by this tree. The man didn't say anything. I looked over at him and he had his hands in his hoodie. While I was looking at him, he said, Get out of the car now. He kept moving his hands inside his sweatshirt as if though he was trying to grab something he had concealed underneath. When I looked up out of the windshield, I saw two more masked men coming from the side of the fallen tree. My heart was racing out of my chest at this point. I didn't know if I was going to get robbed or worse. The man in my car then screamed at the top of his lungs and said, Get out now! I slowly started to open my car door and noticed another two men behind my car also wearing masks. When my door was open, I started to step out, and I noticed the man in my car start to get out of my vehicle as well, and that's when I made the single most daring decision of my life. As I noticed him clearly outside of the car, I jumped back into the driver's seat and reversed as fast as I could. Thankfully, he never ordered me to shut the car off, so the car was running this entire time. I may have bumped into one of the potential robbers, or maybe it was a big tree branch I wasn't sure in the heat of the moment. When I got to the end of the dark path and was putting my car into drive so I could peel off, I looked back one last time and I saw all five men sprinting directly at my car. They all appeared to be holding something in their hands, but I didn't bother to find out what they were carrying. I used to work the register at a local gas station, though I've since left as there were a lot of strange things that happened when I would work overnight but this one situation in particular will stick with me forever. I only worked the night shift a few days a week, usually Friday and Saturday. My shifts were usually boring and honestly just a game of trying to stay awake. The only thing I really had to do was stock the shelves and occasionally help a customer. I would get a lot of drunk people or families on road trips and sometimes even whole groups of friends. But for the most part, it was pretty quiet. On this night, it was around 2am and I hadn't had a customer in over an hour, so I was starting to doze off a little bit. The desk was around the corner from the entrance and there was a bell on the door that rang when somebody walked in. So usually falling asleep wasn't too big of a deal. I woke up after a few minutes, hearing the bell ring and a few seconds later saw a customer walk in. He looked like a typical 30-year-old man that would come in for some beer or a snack. He walked around for a little bit, down every aisle, looking at everything. Now, I've worked in retail for a long time, and I know what it looks like when someone is looking for something specific. But this man had nothing in mind. He was just looking at the shelves, browsing the store. During the day, this is pretty normal but people don't usually come in at 2am to browse the gas station shelves. I looked out the window to my left to see if he was filling up his car and was maybe just passing the time, but there were no cars outside. A couple minutes went by before he eventually looked over at me and said thanks and then walked out. I didn't know what to make of that, but I just figured he stole something small and was just being a dick about it. The whole situation left my mind after a few minutes, and I started to get really tired again. This time, I decided to grab my cart of items to stock, and start filling up the shelves to pass the time. I'm not really sure how long I was stocking for, maybe 20 minutes, before I saw a man show up at the end of the aisle I was stocking. It made me jump a little, as I never heard the door ring. This guy was wearing a large hoodie and dark clothes. I pretty much knew right away that something was very off. The man continued down to the back of the store, and I immediately went back to behind the counter. 
I tried not to stare, but I noticed that as he walked down the aisles, he wasn't looking for anything, he was just browsing. It clicked in my head immediately that this was the same guy from just a little bit ago, but he had changed clothes for some reason. I also came to the realization that he probably came initially to scope out the place before doing whatever he planned on doing. I started to panic in my head. The man began to come down the aisle closest to the counter, and I could see something heavy in his front hoodie pocket. I made a split second decision to try and prevent any further escalation, and I said, Welcome back, sir. Need help finding anything? He made eye contact with me, and I could tell he knew exactly what I was trying to do. He approached the counter, not saying a word, and brought his hand out of his pocket, revealing a small handgun. Then he grabbed a small pack of gum from beside the counter and placed it in front of me. He said just this. Confused and in shock as to what was happening, I didn't even react for a few seconds before eventually scanning the gum nervously. Still holding the gun, he took out a dollar from his jean pocket and threw it on the counter, then said thanks and walked out. I was in total shock, trying to wrap my head around what just happened. I ended up reporting the situation to the police and calling my manager, who didn't pick up. No updates ever came out of the situation, but it had me on edge for the last few months that I worked there. I'm still unsure of what really happened that night, or what the man's intentions were, but honestly, I'm glad I never found out. Because my parents had separated before I was born, I spent my time growing up between each of their houses. Each summer, until I turned 19, I stayed with my dad in rural Missouri. He had grown up in the area himself and most of his family still lived there. Without much to do, like going to the movies and stuff, I would fill my days hanging out with my older cousin and getting into mischief. Many of our long summer days were taken in wandering the surrounding woods. On one of these journeys, we came across a big lake setting quietly by itself out in the middle of nowhere. The water was crystal clear and filled with tons of monstrous fish. We asked the adults if they were aware of its existence, but none had heard of it. That was probably the reason for it having so many large fish. No one living in the area had fished it and any who had in the past allowed its location to be lost. We would fish the pond three or four times, coming away with a stringer full of lunkers on each occasion. On the fifth occasion, we hoped to accumulate enough for a big family fish fry. The summer holiday was starting to wind down and we figured a fish fry would be a great way to cap it off. It was a warm Saturday morning when we headed out. We started about an hour before sunup because the walk-in took over an hour. Besides, the fish stopped biting by the hottest part of the day and we hoped to get back to my dad's house by early afternoon. The beautiful sight of the pond came into view around dawn. It didn't take long for us to get our first bites and for the next three hours the fish came quickly, one after another. Our limit was caught by 10.45 and I was rearing to get going. We had a 90 minute walk back with two 5 gallon buckets packed to the top with fish, so I imagined another 30 could be added to that. To my displeasure, my cousin thought it would be refreshing to take a dip in the lake before we left. He tried to pressure me into joining him, but I didn't know how to swim at the time. I just wanted to get back, but he was older than me, so he was in charge. I plopped my tail onto a rock and waited while he did his thing. There was an old rope tied to a tree, probably from a hundred years ago, and he wanted to swing from it. It looked unsafe to me. However, my concerns were laughed off, and... He stripped down to his boxers, setting his clothes on the ground next to me. He climbed the tree a little way and grabbed the rope. Pushing off, he swung out just a short distance before the rope snapped right above him. He'd made it out far enough to hit the deep water, but probably not as far as he intended. When he hit the water, his body made a dull thud sound. It certainly didn't sound normal and likely hurt. 
I was planning on laughing at him and saying I told you so, but as the seconds pass, he never resurfaced. The situation was quickly becoming scary. I looked around to see if he came up somewhere farther away, perhaps floating unconscious because of the hard contact with the water, but still nothing. I began to panic and waded out as far as I dare looking into the water for him. Unfortunately, the water became cloudy with every step I took and made it impossible to see. Soon it was clear to me that he had drowned. How, I had no idea. Perhaps if I could have swum back then, I may have been able to help him, but it was too late now. I was helpless to do anything more than pack up and head home. On the entire walk back, a small nugget of hope lingered in the back of my mind that he had tricked me and would pop up at some point. This didn't happen, however, and the dread I carried of telling my family grew with each step. I tried several times to find the words, but with each attempt... I would break down and choke on my tears. Ultimately, I could only manage. Mark drowned. They got the point after that, and once I was able to pull myself together, I led my dad and uncle back out to the pond. Mark's body was still nowhere to be found. With no other options, we went into the sheriff's office to report the drowning. When I realized where we were headed, I started freaking out. In my young mind, I thought I was going to get in trouble or be blamed for my cousin's death. It took a few minutes, but they were able to convince me I wasn't in trouble. Even after they had, I couldn't help but feel guilty every time I looked at my uncle. Regardless of what he claimed, I couldn't believe he didn't blame me, even if it was just a small amount. I explained what had happened to the sheriff and the search began the next morning. Just by chance, that was the day I was going back to my mom's. That Monday night, my mom sat me down to tell me that a team of divers had found Mark's body earlier that day. When they discovered him, one of his feet were hung up on a sunken log, so they assumed that was why he never resurfaced. I wish I could say this made me feel better, but it did not. It did, however, serve as a catalyst to learn how to swim. The guilt of not being able to help my cousin stayed with me for most of my life, and I never wanted to be in the position of not being able to help another person ever again. So in a twisted kind of way, his death had a positive impact on my life. However, if I had the choice, I'd still prefer that he be with us. Although what I'm about to tell you may sound like one of your run-of-the-mill horror movies, I swear by the validity of it and what I saw. It all started on a very hot July day this past year. My car is almost 20 years old and sometimes overheats on hot days, just like this one. However, until I get a better paying job, it's the car I'm stuck with. This day, I was driving through the back roads looking for a family of dog breeders a friend had told me about. I'd been searching for the place for several hours and was approaching the warmest part of the day. As per usual, my car began overheating and I was forced to pull over. I picked up my phone to call my girlfriend only to see that my battery was dead. After I spent a couple of minutes cussing my luck, I acknowledged that I was going to have to find someone with a working phone. That wasn't going to happen unless I started walking. Soon. I spotted an old farmhouse off in the distance and headed toward it. A trip that would have taken half an hour on a normal day took almost an hour because of the oppressive heat. I had to take several breaks during the course of the journey, but eventually made it. The area around the house looked more like a junkyard. Parts of old cars spread about, and I had to weave through a maze of them to reach the front door. I knocked on the door for several minutes, but got no answer. Thinking maybe that the homeowner may be hard of hearing, I walked around and looked into the windows hoping to see someone inside. At the side of the house, I spotted the telephone hanging on the wall just inside the kitchen. Now that I knew that there was a phone, I became excited and started calling out for someone. Even after walking all the way around, no reply came. I was about to give up until I saw a woman lying on a bed. 
I very nearly banged on the window to try and get her attention, but I figured that may scare her, so I went to the front door and let myself in. Now in hindsight, that was just as scary. But before I entered, however, I took a piece of paper from a notebook I carry with me and wrote out a note explaining what I was doing there. Even then, I called out several times as I approached the bedroom. Still no answer came and I continued toward the room. The closer I got to the woman, the more her appearance began to unnerve me. She was laying flat on her back and staring blankly at the ceiling. I had initially believed she was watching the television that was turned on in the room with her, but her eyes sat completely still. Regardless, I got closer and, once I was within a few steps, handed her the note. When the note touched her hand, she didn't react. This caused me to get closer and this was when I realized something was very wrong. Her face had a very dry, almost mummified look to it. Her hair was a vibrant black, a color not often seen on older females. She had to have known I was there by that point, but her eyes stayed fixed. This is what caused me to lean in even closer and look into her eyes. Rather than being slightly bloodshot or moist looking like most people's, they had a shiny, glassy appearance, like they were fake. In spite of this, not until I actually touched her did I know for sure that she was dead. I realized that perhaps she was a mannequin rather than a human, so I reached down to touch her bare hand. The texture of her skin was dry, but stone cold to the touch. The oddity of this was just beginning to really sink in, when a loud creaking noise came from behind me. Without a second thought, I tore out of there and ran back down the road in the direction of my car. Within a half of a mile, I ran into an older man in a truck, and thankfully he agreed to give me a ride back into town. I said nothing about my experience to him, and any time he attempted to make small talk, I said as little as I could, on the off chance that he may have been involved in what happened to that woman. He let me borrow his phone to call my girlfriend and she agreed to meet us at a gas station on the edge of town. When he let me out there, I thanked him and he went on his way. Once I was safely inside my girlfriend's car, I borrowed her phone to call the police. I hadn't even told her about it yet, so the look of shock on her face as I described what I saw showed me what my expression likely was at the time I discovered it. The cops said they'd send out a car to the house to check out my claims. I called a wrecker next to pick up my car. The police never called me back, so after waiting three days, I called to inquire about what they found. It took a few minutes to find a person aware of my call, but once I did, the officer said that he and his partner searched the entire property and found nothing out of the ordinary, especially not a mummified woman. I thanked them and hung up. What happened after I fled, I can only guess. The noise behind me was probably the owner of the home, and he hid the woman's body knowing that the cops were likely to be called. To tell you the truth, I'm not sure what I saw in that house, on that bed. I am positive that I saw a human lying on that bed, but that's all. More than once, I've been tempted to grab a camera and return to the house to get proof of my claims, but fear of the unknown and what else could be waiting for me if I did has stopped me. If the nightmares of her soulless eyes continue, however, I may have no other choice. This happened about five years ago now. I had just gotten through a really rough breakup of a codependent relationship. So I was going through a phase of trying to be more independent, self-sufficient, and just generally more okay with being alone. I would go to a lot of movies, restaurants, etc. all by myself. At the time, I was living in Montana where spending time outdoors is a prime recreation. Camping solo seemed like it would be a really good exercise in truly being self-reliant. So I packed a little tent and went to Jerry Johnson Hot Springs. Jerry Johnson is a natural hot springs with a few small, mostly natural pools in the mountains on the border of Montana and Idaho. 
I'm going to try and keep this as brief as possible, so I won't go on explaining the place. What I will say, however, is that it's truly in the middle of nowhere. From the interstate, it's about a one-third mile hike across the bridge and into the woods. And from the interstate, it's about a 45-minute drive in either direction before you reach any kind of civilization in the form of a gas station. There isn't a motel or anything attached to the hot springs like there are with some. It's really just forest land with a few tiny ponds of warm water, and if you ever go, you'll probably be the only person there. There's plenty of daylight, so I decide I'll go soak first and then set up my camp when I'm finished. I make the short hike to find that there's a couple, a man and a woman around their 30s in the main pool, and they look kind of startled to see me. I say a friendly hello from a distance as I then approach. At first, they don't really respond, they just kind of stare at me. Then the guy pipes up. What are you doing, man? I then tell him that I'm really confused and I don't know what he means. The man then asks, Are you the one that's been creeping around the woods and watching us for the last hour or so? I assured them that I didn't know what they were talking about, and they begin to tell me that there's someone in the woods way off of the trail. Apparently they'd been yelling at him and he just doesn't respond. He'll walk away into the woods for a while and then reappear somewhere else just watching them. After they've been assured that it isn't me, I get undressed and get into the water. The pupils in their eyes were huge. I'm guessing that they ate some magic mushrooms. I never asked, but it seemed pretty obvious. It's not a big deal. It's basically the perfect setting for something like that, but it makes me think that they might just be having a bad trip. We talk for a while and first about the creepy guy and then about some other stuff. The mood lightens and they seem pretty relieved not to be alone. I'm a relatively large guy and I guess there's strength in numbers. No more sightings of the creeper. They get out of the pool before me. I'm in the pool all by myself for about 10 minutes before I then hear some shouting in the woods. I decide to cut my soak short just in case someone's in trouble. I get out, dry off quickly, and then get dressed, still mostly wet, when I then hear another shout. I then start quickly hiking. I eventually come across the couple that was shouting off into the woods and saying things like, Hey man, we have a gun. Which they didn't. I ask what's going on and they say that the guy was just ominously standing in the path looking at them way off in the distance. When they started to shout at him, he left the path again and then retreated into the woods. Now he's out of sight. Through all of this happening, they never get a good look at him. We walk back to our cars. We decide that we're all going to camp near each other. There's an official campground, but you have to pay. The guy tells me that he knows about another spot that's relatively flat that would probably work for us. I agree and I decide to follow them. It's not very far. They set up their tent and I set up mine about a hundred yards away. I wanted to give them plenty of space to trip or whatever and I was out there in the first place to camp alone. We were in a dry season on raw forest floor so neither of us made a campfire. I got all set up and just sat around reading a book, really enjoying all of the nature. The mosquitoes made me retreat into my tent at about 6 p.m., and by 9 I was sound asleep. At about midnight, I was then awoken by the sound of screaming. I grabbed my flashlight and my 22 pistol, put on my shoes but didn't tie them, and then started running toward the other tent. When I arrived, the two were standing outside of the tent with their own flashlights and completely losing it. They said that the guy had been there and that we all needed to get the crap out of there ASAP. They showed me a slice in the wall of their tent that he had made with a knife. They then haphazardly packed all of their stuff in a hurry and we went back to the cars. I only then realized that I hadn't actually grabbed any of my own stuff. I asked if they would go back with me to get it, and they basically just said, Sorry dude, you're on your own, then got in their car and took off. I then thought about it for a minute. I could come back the next day and get my stuff, but it was over an hour drive in each direction, and I was there now. I did have a gun, but if I shot someone in the woods, even if self-defense, that would be the beginning of another nightmare that would probably last the rest of my life. 
I made the decision and decided to go back for my stuff. I killed my flashlight and basically went stealth ninja mode back into the tree surrounding the clearing where my tent was. My thought was that if I was really quiet then I could probably hear him but he couldn't hear me. It took me about 20 minutes to get where my tent was since I was moving so slowly. When I got back to my tent, it was totally untouched. I quickly threw on my backpack, put my flashlight in my mouth, grabbed my tent in its fully assembled state with my sleeping bag still inside of it, and then ran back to the car with a loaded 22 revolver in my hand. I went back to my car, started it, and drove away. What didn't really occur to me until later is that I never actually saw this guy, and to this day, I can't really be sure that there was actually anyone in the woods at all. I really kind of doubt that these people would have sliced their own tent, but at the same time, I kind of doubt that there was actually just a dude hanging out in the wilderness all day and night just to freak these campers out. It's really possible that the two campers were really just messing around with me. If so, they really deserve Oscars for their performance, as they really seem genuinely terrified. I guess I'll never really know though. I remembered something that had happened to my best friend and I a few years ago, and I figured I would share it here. While my best friend and I were seniors in high school, we went on a weekend trip to visit my grandmother a couple hours away from my town in Georgia. The town that we lived in was comparatively small for the state, but one of the biggest towns within a few hours. But we had to travel about two and a half hours through tiny, somewhat redneck towns to get to my grandmother's place. We were on our way back home when we had to stop at a gas station literally in the middle of nowhere. I'm talking cornfields, cotton fields, streets with no signs or lights, not even stop signs, and definitely no cell service. The convenience store that was attached to the gas station had maybe a couple snacks inside but looked deserted from the outside, and we decided not to bother to get anything other than gas. I paid with card, mainly because I didn't want to leave my 5 foot 1 100 pound friend all alone in the car while I went alone inside. Another car had pulled up on the other side of the single gas pump while I just started pumping my gas, and because of everything I'd read before on Let's Not Meet, I already had a really weird feeling and decided to stay alert and stand outside of the car with my driver's side door wide open. The reason I did this was so that my friend could see and hear everything that was going on. A thin late 50s ish older man got out of the car and seemed to be paying at the pump and standing beside his car while he got gas. But after a few seconds, he walked around the pump and then maneuvered himself around my car door to stand within a foot of me and asked if he could pump my gas for me. Luckily, the gas nozzle was locked, so it was pumping without me having to hold it. I immediately placed myself between the opening of the door and the man, and I prepared to either shut the door with me inside it, or move and slam it behind me to protect my friend if necessary. I calmly told him it was fine and no thank you. He looked me up and down with the corner of his lip tilted up and then said, You know, pretty girls like you shouldn't be out here all alone and you definitely shouldn't have to do this by yourself. Let a man help you, baby." And then proceeded to cover my hand with his own as he reached for the gas pump that I was holding. I jerked my hand out from underneath his and then slammed my car door shut. I then jerked my hand out from underneath his and slammed my car door shut. Thinking the last thing that I would want is him jumping in my car and driving away with my friend in the passenger seat. Red flags were totally going off now. My typical overly polite demeanor turned serious as I remember something that I'd read here that said that it was better to be safe and to seem mean rather than be polite and uncomfortable. So I then responded and said, Sir, get away from me. I can pump my own gas and I've already said no thank you. Leave us alone. He didn't move, only raised his chin and managed to make eye contact with me. His tilted lip totally gone now. I stared him down and I figured I'd gotten enough gas to last us enough time to get the crap out of wherever we were. So I made eye contact, pulled the nozzle out, and basically threw it back into the pump before getting in my car and driving away before he had even moved. As we drove away, I glanced in the rear view and saw that his car wasn't even being filled up with gas. So I'm guessing he was just driving by and then decided to help out a damsel in distress. 
even though I was nowhere even close to being a damsel in distress. My friend was shaking the whole way home, telling me she would have just let the man pump our gas. But I'm really glad of some of the confidence that I'd gained from this sub. It helped me stay attentive and respond confidently enough to get out of that crazy situation. So to the creepy, helpful gas station man in the middle of Ghost Town, Georgia, hopefully we won't meet ever again. I was helping my boyfriend move from Wisconsin to Colorado. I had driven out to Wisconsin and picked up some of his stuff while he carried the rest of it in his own car. So we were driving separately. Somewhere in the middle of Nebraska towards the end of the day, we found out that his car was having some issues that would need to be repaired before we could make the rest of the trip to Colorado. We decided to stay at the motel for the night and find somewhere to repair the car at in the morning. We took the car into the shop and it was actually able to be repaired before the end of the day. The shop called my boyfriend to let him know he could come pick it up, so I drove him out there. When we got to the shop, I realized that I'd left my phone at the motel. I wasn't too worried as even though I wasn't too familiar with the area, I figured I could follow my boyfriend as he drove back to the motel for the night. As I saw my boyfriend exit the shop in his car, other cars shortly followed behind him, so I lost track of him. I decided to try and find the way back to the motel on my own, to the best of my memory. It was pretty much just straight down the main road until you saw the sign for the motel on the left side. I kept driving down the main road until I realized I had never even seen the motel sign. I was lost and I really started to panic as I had no phone and I had no idea how to get back to the motel. I began to notice a white SUV that was following my car for about five minutes. He eventually pulled into the lane to the left of me. Sitting at a stoplight, I saw the man in the white SUV motion to roll down my window. Being confused and not really knowing how to react, I rolled it down. Hey, what are you doing? He said. Uh, nothing, I replied, not really sure why he was asking this. Well, why don't you uh, pull over and come talk to me for a second? After hearing this, I quickly shook my head and then rolled up the window. The last thing that I wanted was to be stranded in this town with some weird stranger following me. The light turned green and that's when I saw my boyfriend's car then pull up right behind mine. I then pulled off into the closest parking lot, to which my boyfriend followed. Luckily, the SUV was nowhere in sight. He said he was trying to catch up and find my car once he didn't see me at the motel. I let him drive me back that night so we could return for my car in the morning. Thank goodness my boyfriend had found me at the right time, as I'm not really sure what would have happened that night if he hadn't have found me, and if that man in the SUV had followed me any further. When you go off to college, a lot of people warn you about the dangers that can occur on campus, but what no one warns you about is the ride home. While I'm sure most people have fun and possibly even memorable rides home from school with their family, mine was only memorable because I made it home with my life. It was the beginning of December and the fall semester had just ended. And at the time, I had made plans with some friends back at home to go see the midnight release of a movie that was coming out instead of taking my exams and then driving home the next day. I planned to drive home as soon as I finished my schoolwork. This meant that I left campus around 4 in the afternoon. I would make it to the mall for the movie just in time. So I did just that. I left right after my last test, and I could not have been more excited to see my friends. I had about a six and a half hour drive ahead of me, so I got comfortable and began making my way home as quickly but safely as possible. Now that being said, even though I was in a rush, I was still raised to be helpful. I was always taught growing up that if you saw someone on the side of the road, you stop and ask if they need help 
Sometimes people don't need anything, and you just keep driving, but you never know when someone might need you. So at around 9.30 at night, as I was driving along this dimly lit back road, when I saw a car parked on the side of the road, I didn't even hesitate. I pulled over and hopped out of my car to ask if they needed any help. Right away, I could see the car was being driven by an elderly man, and he claimed that his car had a flat tire on the passenger side and asked me if I would help him put the spare on for him. I told him of course and asked him to pop the trunk so I could get the tire out, and he did. But as I leaned into the trunk to lift up the mat that covers the spare, I felt the man press something against my neck. My entire body tensed up as I could feel the shocks from the taser that he just pressed against me fired. I keeled over forward and the man was able to easily push me and force me into the trunk of his car before slamming it shut. I recovered from being tased before we pulled off from the side of the road, but as I reached above me for the emergency handle that it's in most trunks, I couldn't find it. I could feel the tires moving as we began making our way down the secluded back street when I realized the old man had forgotten to take my phone before locking me up. He must have been in such a hurry and didn't want to risk being overpowered that it didn't even cross his mind. I squirmed around in the trunk until I could get my hand into my pocket and pull my phone out. After calling the police and telling them what road I was just on, it was only a matter of a couple of minutes before they were able to find me. I heard the sound of police sirens behind us as they pulled the elderly man over, and once the car came to a stop, I began banging on the trunk to let the officers know where I was. Once the man was in custody and I was out of the trunk, I asked the officer if he knew why the man tried to abduct me, but he didn't know why. It wasn't until the trial that we learned that this man who I thought was old and frail, had actually confessed to abducting multiple people between the 90s and the late 2000s. I was just the lucky one. I am a 20-year-old female, but the story took place when I was 11. I was with my younger cousin, who was also a female, and was around 8 years old at this time. We will call her Julie. Our small town was located on the outskirts of Rockford, Illinois. It has a notorious reputation for drugs, violent crime, and sex trafficking. I lived in a neighborhood with a Casey's gas station within walking distance. I would often go there with my friends to buy energy drinks, snacks, and junk food. I could go there pretty much whenever I wanted to, since nobody had to drive me there. My parents didn't keep too close of an eye on me, and I was a fairly self-sufficient kid for my age, which was definitely to my advantage in this experience. One night, Julie and I decided to have a sleepover at my house. I told my parents we were going to walk to the gas station to grab some drinks with my leftover birthday money. They were talking and drinking with my aunt and uncle, and just sort of shooed us away. It took us maybe 10 to 15 minutes to walk there. As we were entering the parking lot, we saw a big semi-truck parked in front of the building. This wasn't that unusual, especially if supply is being dropped off. As we were walking past it, a middle-aged man came out of the gas station and asked us how we were doing. We were polite kids, so we stayed and talked with him for a couple of minutes. Do you girls like horses? We both replied, Yes. There are a couple of thoroughbreds in the trailer if you want to look at them real quick. Julie got really excited and instantly agreed and begins to make her way to the other side of the truck. I hesitated, feeling that something was really off about this situation for two reasons. One, there wasn't a diesel pump at this gas station and this man didn't seem to be dropping off any supplies at the store. There was another gas station that did have diesel pumps less than a mile down the road. 2. The trailer wasn't the right kind for him to have horses in it. Horse trailers have large windows so that the horses can breathe and whatnot. If you were to put a horse inside the trailer that he was hauling, it would have suffocated. This was the biggest red flag for me. 
there was no way he actually had horses in his trailer. He took a step closer to us, and I began to panic before blurting out, uh, My dad is actually going to be here any minute, so we're in a bit of a hurry. Julie protested, knowing that this was a lie. I had to cover up by saying that he had texted me while we were walking. Oh, are you girls sure you don't want to see them? It would only take a second. He said as he inched closer to us. I apologized to him, grabbed Julie by the arm, and pulled her into the gas station. I didn't stop there though. I dragged her all the way to the women's bathroom. All the while, she was complaining about not getting to see the horses. I had to tell her why I lied, and when she understood, she went quiet. After five minutes, I told her to wait there, and that I would go see if the man was gone. As I peered through the window into the parking lot, I saw that the coast was clear. So we bought what we came for, and left with a bag in each of our arms. It was dark by this point, and to avoid any other interactions with strange people with dangerous propositions, we trespassed through a field instead of walking along the main road. We both figured that would be the better route from now on. We never told our parents about this encounter because we didn't want them to say that we could no longer go by ourselves anymore. I know that sounds like a dumb reason, but I figured if I could sniff out one potential kidnapping, I could do the same if it were to ever happen again. I was a strange kid, and I really loved books, movies, and shows related to kidnapping. The point is, I felt like I could handle this kind of situation if it came my way again. Now that I'm older, I know that mindset was incredibly stupid, since I'm now aware of the gamble I was taking. I'm lucky that was the only time that I had ever felt unsafe there. I was 23 years old when this happened, and was living in the city of brotherly love at the time. Philadelphia. The girl I was dating lived about 35 to 40 minutes outside of the city, near West Chester. After hanging out for a while, I left her place around 12.30 a.m. I really shouldn't have stayed out that late because I had an early shift that morning. As soon as I left her neighborhood, I noticed that my gas light was on. I put in directions to the nearest gas station on my GPS and drove five minutes to the local Wawa. I was familiar with this area. It was very low on crime, unlike many other places outside of Philly. So stopping here this late at night wasn't something that I was nervous about. There were two other cars parked there when I pulled in. I filled my tank and I realized that two of my tires were low on air, so I drove to the corner of the parking lot where they had the air pumps. I started working on my first tire. When I looked up and saw an older pickup truck pulling into the parking lot, I didn't think twice about it, until it drove up right next to my car. The truck began backing into the area where another air pump was. Any other day. I would have just assumed that it was somebody else trying to get air into their tires. But something gave me a bad feeling. The driver exited the truck. He looked to be in his late 50s, early 60s, and had scruffy facial hair and glasses. He looked like the stereotypical creep. He just stood by his driver's side door and stared at me. This was when I began to feel uneasy. Uh, is your pump out of order, sir? I asked, trying to break the tension. The man did not respond. He just kept giving me that cold stare. He finally moved away from the door and reached into the bed of his truck, his eyes never leaving me. He then produced a rope and began sprinting toward me. I immediately threw down the air nozzle and jumped into my car, which was already running. I threw it into drive, when suddenly, a hand slammed directly on my driver's side window and dragged sideways as I peeled out of there, leaving a smear. 
As I was driving home, my heart was pounding out of my chest for the first 10 minutes. I've never had anything like this happen to me. Two weeks later, a girl I was friends with on Instagram posted an article about multiple kidnappings in the Westchester area. I immediately thought back to that man in the truck. I'm thankful that I was able to escape. I almost became a statistic. This happened late one night when I was driving back home from work on a dark and lonely highway. It was the kind of night that makes you wish that you were at home relaxing instead of being out on the road. There were no other cars in sight, and by happenstance, I was driving through dark territory, meaning that there was no reception on my phone. I had been driving for quite some time and was starting to zone out a little bit. That's not to say that I was falling asleep behind the wheel. I was just sort of on autopilot. As I rounded a bend, I saw a semi-truck parked on the side of the road ahead of me. Not really anything out of the ordinary. Truckers will sometimes park off to the side to catch some shut-eye during their long trips across the country. But there was something about this truck that unnerved me. I got the feeling that whoever was behind the wheel wasn't resting. They were waiting. I slowed down as I approached the truck and I tried to get a good look inside of the cab, but the windows were tinted and it was very dark out, so it was like looking into a black void. I also noticed that both the truck and the trailer were completely black. After passing the truck, I sped up and returned to my original speed. I didn't want to go too fast in case a trooper was hiding out somewhere, tagging passing cars. As I continued down the road, I kept thinking back to that strange truck I saw. I couldn't shake off the feeling that I was in some kind of danger. Perhaps it was just my overactive imagination. Damn it, get a hold of yourself. It was just a truck recounting sheep on the side of the road. Saying it out loud did not make it any more convincing. There was something off about that truck. As I was about to turn down another corner, I heard the unmistakable sound of an engine revving up behind me. I looked in my rearview mirror as a pair of headlights came up fast behind me. I panicked and pressed down on my gas pedal, but my car was nowhere near fast enough to outrun the truck. The headlights were now directly behind me, practically blinding me. My heart was pounding out of my chest. I knew that there was something up with that truck, but now I had to do everything I could to get away from it. But the road was narrow with no side streets or exits in sight. I was trapped out here, with this massive 18-wheeler right behind me. Suddenly, a hidden trooper didn't sound too bad. As we continued down the road, the truck eventually slowed down and stayed a safe distance behind me, still not making any attempts to pass me. The truck then flicked off its headlights. Oh, hell no. I immediately sped up, Looking into my rearview mirror, I could make out the vague silhouette of the truck getting further and further away as I floored it down the highway until it disappeared from view. When I finally arrived home safely, I parked my car in the driveway and went inside, making sure that all my doors and windows were locked. I was exhausted. Nothing takes it out of you like being afraid for your life out on a dark highway. I just wanted to get some sleep and put this entire thing behind me. About an hour later, I was woken up by the unmistakable sound of an idling engine coming from outside. Half asleep, I got up and looked out my window. I became fully awake once I saw what was parked outside a black semi-truck parked in the road outside of my house. Not only was I terrified from my previous encounter, but what was equally jarring was that this massive truck was in a residential area. I have no idea how that driver maneuvered down the narrow streets. This was the first time I got a good look at the truck. It had no commercial markings on it whatsoever, 
so there was no chance of me calling a number to let the company know that one of their drivers is a psychopath with a bad case of road rage. Also, I never got a good look at the driver's tags, but I imagine they would have read, beating you. I mentally could not handle seeing the truck outside of my house. I just remember saying, no. And crawling back into bed, I didn't have the energy to deal with this insane shit. I just remembered hearing the truck pulling away as I drifted off to sleep. To this day, I'm still not sure if the driver somehow found out where I lived or if it was just a very vivid nightmare. The next morning, I considered calling the police to report the strange encounter, but honestly, what were they going to do? There was no damage to my car, and there was no proof of what happened out there on the highway. Over the next few weeks, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being followed. I became severely paranoid, constantly looking over my shoulder and freaking out every time I saw a dark colored truck. One day I was walking back from the grocery store and I saw a black semi parked on the side of the road. After nearly having a panic attack, I was put at ease once I saw the commercial markings on the side of its trailer. I realized that it was just another semi truck with a black paint job. What happened to me that night was terrifying, but the fear that it caused me was taking over my ability to be rational. After a while, I could not allow it to control me anymore and I eventually had to move on with my life. It's been years, but I still think about that black semi-truck from time to time. Ultimately, this experience has taught me to trust my instincts and to be extremely cautious when driving alone on remote roads. I still wonder who was behind the wheel of that truck and what their intentions were. When you go off to college, a lot of people warn you about the dangers that can occur on campus, but what no one warns you about is the ride home. While I'm sure most people have fun and possibly even memorable rides home from school with their family, mine was only memorable because I made it home with my life. It was the beginning of December and the fall semester had just ended. And at the time, I had made plans with some friends back at home to go see the midnight release of a movie that was coming out instead of taking my exams and then driving home the next day. I planned to drive home as soon as I finished my schoolwork. This meant that I left campus around 4 in the afternoon. I would make it to the mall for the movie just in time. So I did just that. I left right after my last test, and I could not have been more excited to see my friends. I had about a six and a half hour drive ahead of me, so I got comfortable and began making my way home as quickly but safely as possible. Now that being said, even though I was in a rush, I was still raised to be helpful. I was always taught growing up that if you saw someone on the side of the road, you stop and ask if they need help. Sometimes people don't need anything and you just keep driving, but you never know when someone might need you. So at around 9.30 at night, as I was driving along this dimly lit back road, when I saw a car parked on the side of the road, I didn't even hesitate. I pulled over and hopped out of my car to ask if they needed any help. Right away, I could see the car was being driven by an elderly man, and he claimed that his car had a flat tire on the passenger side and asked me if I would help him put the spare on for him. I told him of course and asked him to pop the trunk so I could get the tire out, and he did. But as I leaned into the trunk to lift up the mat that covers the spare, I felt the man press something against my neck. My entire body tensed up as I could feel the shocks from the taser that he just pressed against me fired. I keeled over forward and the man was able to easily push me and force me into the trunk of his car before slamming it shut. I recovered from being tased before we pulled off from the side of the road. But as I reached above me for the emergency handle that it's in most trunks, I couldn't find it. I could feel the tires moving as we began making our way down the secluded back street when I realized the old man had forgotten to take my phone before locking me up. He must have been in such a hurry and didn't want to risk being overpowered that it didn't even cross his mind. 
I squirmed around in the trunk until I could get my hand into my pocket and pull my phone out. After calling the police and telling them what road I was just on, it was only a matter of a couple of minutes before they were able to find me. I heard the sound of police sirens behind us as they pulled the elderly man over, and once the car came to a stop, I began banging on the trunk to let the officers know where I was. Once the man was in custody and I was out of the trunk, I asked the officer if he knew why the man tried to abduct me, but he didn't know why. It wasn't until the trial that we learned that this man, who I thought was old and frail, had actually confessed to abducting multiple people between the 90s and the late 2000s. I was just the lucky one. About four years ago, when I was in college, I went to a university that was about two hours away from my girlfriend's college. I would drive down to her campus sometimes on Friday afternoons, and then we would hang out for the weekend. I would typically leave to go back on Sunday night. Usually, I would try to leave by 10 p.m. at the latest on Sunday nights to get back to my dorm on campus by midnight. I had a 9 a.m. class on Mondays after all, but many times I would stay later than I should. One time, I stayed until nearly midnight and then began driving back to my campus. Unfortunately, not long after I started driving back, maybe like 20 minutes, I began to feel very sleepy. I kept going and hoped that I would feel more awake, but I was only getting more and more tired as I went on. I was starting to struggle to keep my eyes open, and obviously, it was becoming a very dangerous situation. Then, I decided that I needed to stop and do something to help myself wake up. Maybe get an energy drink or something. I kept my eyes open to the sides of the road to see if I would pass by any gas stations or rest stops. I knew that I wouldn't be able to make it much farther without falling asleep. At the next exit, I took it and I hoped that I would come across something. The exit led me down to a quiet road and not too far down it appeared to be a gas station. I was really happy to see it. I pulled into the parking lot, but when I did, it appeared that the store part of the gas station was closed. The lights were off inside and there were no cars in the parking lot whatsoever. I even got out and tried the door, but it was locked. I went back to my car then and got inside. I was still extremely tired. That's when I just sat back and closed my eyes. I wasn't thinking all that clearly from being so tired, and I guess I felt that maybe I could take a brief 15 minute nap or something. All I know is when I closed my eyes it felt so good. I started to drift off to sleep and I was out within probably 15 seconds. The next thing I knew, I was waking up to see a car was parked next to me. I was groggy and I almost went right back to sleep at first, but I had a bad feeling. The feeling was almost like I needed to get away from there and I was in danger. I looked at the car that was parked next to me. It was a silver sedan and it looked to be about 20 years old or so. Then the driver's door opened. I felt a little bit suspicious because they parked right next to me out of all the other spaces in the parking lot. I could barely see the person as they walked around the car over to mine. When they made it around, I finally saw them. It was a man wearing a white sweatshirt with his hood up and he had on like a type of mask that covered his whole face. It was like a costume mask of some sort, but I didn't recognize the character. When he approached my driver's window, I had no interest to stick around. I started my car up right then, and as I did, the man attempted to open my driver's door. My door was locked though, and I put my car into reverse and then backed up and drove away from him. I saw him then start sprinting back to his car as I was speeding out of the parking lot. Suddenly, I was wide awake and I didn't feel like sleeping at all. I sped onto the road and then back onto the freeway. I wasn't driving recklessly or anything, but I was definitely pushing the speed limit. When I got back onto the freeway, I saw that a car was merging right behind me, which happened to be the silver car. I had no plans to try to outrun them and I drove at a normal pace. The guy sped up until he was right behind me. He got within probably five feet of the back of my car and he stayed at that pace for a good minute or so. There were no other cars on the freeway at all. This area was really not that populated. In fact, most of the drive from my girlfriend's college to mine was just farms and woodland. I don't think I had seen another car the entire time that I was on the freeway. I sped up just a little bit, and as soon as I did, the guy behind me did as well. I switched lanes back and forth once, and he did the same. Then he sped up and hit the back end of my car. I couldn't believe it. He then crashed into it again, but this time harder. I think this guy had to be crazy or something. Then he backed off, and then went forward and hit me for a third time, 
This time, it was so hard that I nearly lost control of my car entirely and spun out. I sped up then because I was desperate, but as I did, I noticed way up ahead that there appeared to be a semi-truck. I kept speeding up, and so did the guy behind me. When we got sort of close to the semi, the guy behind me then switched lanes and sped off, passing both me and the semi-truck. He probably went over 100 miles per hour when he passed the truck. I slowed back down again once I made it to the semi-truck. The truck honked at me, probably seeing the damage on the back side of my car. I slowed down more and then called the police about the situation. I'm not sure why I didn't think to call the police sooner, but it's probably best or I might have crashed or something trying to handle the phone and driving. An officer came out and pulled me over where I was able to give my side of the story. He had me take the next exit and then stayed with me while I called my roadside service. I basically ended up staying up all night from waiting for my car to get towed and everything. I'm not sure whatever happened to the driver of the other car, whoever he was. I would recommend everybody to not drive late at night unless you have to, and especially never drive if you're tired. I'm 27 and currently out of work. I recently got laid off at my job as the company I worked for was starting to go under. So in an effort to keep up with the bills, I started delivering for Uber Eats part time. A couple of my friends suggested it and so I figured I'd give it a try until I found another job. To my surprise, it was actually good money. The only thing I didn't like was some of the places the app had me delivered to. I live in a city with a lot of sketchy areas. I try to stay away from those areas while delivering but there's only so much you can do. This night, a Saturday, I got a McDonald's order. I usually don't accept those ones, but this night was strangely dead, which was weird. Saturday nights are usually the busiest for Uber Eats. Anyway, I pick up the order and start heading towards the address I'm given. Instantly, I realized it was not in the best area, but by this point, I decided to just suck it up. I pulled up to the house, and right away, the vibe was off. It was completely dark with not a single light on in the house. Usually there's at least a light on upstairs, or something that would signal someone being awake and waiting for their order. But the house seemed dead. Nevertheless, I put the car in park, turned off the engine, grabbed the order, and started walking towards the door. I walked onto the porch, and as I reached for the front door, I saw it. The door was slightly cracked open. I knocked, and as I did, the door opened slightly more. I yelled out that I had an Uber Eats order, and right away some man walked to the front door, like as if he had just been waiting right there. As he got closer, I got a good look at him. Now, I'm not one to judge a person by their physical appearance, but this guy was practically covered head to toe in tattoos. The guy looked extremely intimidating, definitely not someone you'd want to mess with. He had this look of frustration, or almost anger on his face. He was staring at me dead in the eyes. I lifted up the bag of food, and he grabbed it. The guy then started reaching in his pocket. I figured he was going to give me a tip, but no. Before I knew it, the guy was holding a hunting knife and pointing it in my direction. My stomach dropped, realizing the situation I was now in. I was either going to get robbed for everything I had, or worst case scenario, killed. My mind was now racing. Thinking as fast as I could, I turned around towards my car, screamed at Derek to grab the gun, and put my hand in my pocket to start my car's engine from a button on the key. But there was no Derek, and I was in no way armed. But I figured if I could somehow convince this guy I was, I gave myself a chance to get out of this. All I could do was pray that the threat along with the vehicle starting would be enough to convince this guy I didn't come here alone. And luckily it was. The guy shoved me back and slammed the front door. I ran back to my car and practically tore the door off trying to get in. I got out of there as fast as I could. I would of course end up calling the police, but I never heard anything back about whatever ended up happening. I assume they didn't find anything, and that the guy was long gone by the time they arrived on scene. But I can't confirm this. If there's one thing I'm sure of, it's how fortunate I am to own a car with a remote proximity key, as I don't think the guy would have bought the whole act if I didn't start the engine. I still drive for Uber Eats every once in a while, but I've since started carrying a knife on me at all times. So the first event goes down when I took a delivery to a nice big house in a peaceful suburban neighborhood. This middle-aged guy had to be in his late 50s or 60s, 
answers the door and invites me in while he goes to grab his wallet. Any other time, I'd have opted to stay outside on the porch, but the house was seriously impressive looking from the outside that I wanted to check out what kind of interiors it had going on. So, I follow him to his back porch but stop dead in my tracks when I notice the large TV screen that's playing some kind of hardcore adult movie. When he noticed I had stopped, and that it was making me uncomfortable, he didn't bother to apologize or turn it off. In fact, he seemed to like the idea that he was basically forcing me to watch something so sleazy and beckoned me to come out onto the porch to join him. Naturally, I declined, got the money, and left. The other thing happened at an extended stay hotel that had a real bad rep, mostly from fellow delivery drivers who ended up getting robbed or jumped. So I follow the delivery instructions and head around to a side door where I find I actually needed a code to get in. Luckily, a guy sticks his head out of the window and says the pizza's for him, adding that he'll be right down to pick it up. As I'm waiting for the guy to let me in, someone else comes along and lets me in, so I ended up meeting the guy on the stairs. Now, rather than exchanging money and leaving as you might expect, the guy tells me he doesn't have the money. Some other guy back in the room has it and asks me to come upstairs with him. With the first red flag tingling in the back of my head, I step into the elevator with him. The doors close and he says something to the effect of, Hey, check this out and begins to lift his shirt. Second and third red flags here. Under his shirt, he's been wrapped with bandages around his stomach. I'll save you the graphic details, but it was obviously a bad wound. A stab wound, if I had to guess. He proceeds to confirm that he was in fact stabbed the other night, and that it was on the news and that I might have seen it, and after a pause in the conversation, that it hurts a lot. With the most awkward silence ever, we step off the elevator, go to his room, and he pops inside before coming back to invite me inside. Now two thoughts go through my mind. Either this is the dumbest setup for a robbery I'd ever seen, or the couch guy is really, really lazy. I eventually settle on the fact that if this were a robbery, the guy probably wouldn't have advertised this gaping stab wound and I kind of wanted to meet the laziest man in the world. So I step in the door, careful not to let freshly mixed stab wounds get my back. Inside, there's an older white-haired man on the couch and a young tweaked-out girl. The man hands the money to the girl and, naturally, it's a hundred-dollar bill and that's the only cash she has. So reluctantly, I make change for him out of my own money, conclude the transaction, and hastily retreat from what I can only assume was some kind of meth house. 